open meeting law. This meeting is being recorded by Norcan and may be recorded by other local media. We're also streaming via Zoom, so the town is recording via Zoom. If you could all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. This meeting is being recorded. Of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You are muted. <laughs> no, just press. <laughs> Same thing again. You are unmuted. Okay. Folks, we have a lot of business on the agenda, and we're happy that you joined us. We have a lot of department budgets to get through. But first, we have the pleasure of recognizing one of our members who's sadly retiring. So we welcome. Happily retiring. No, she's happily retiring. She's happily retiring. <laughs> she's happily retiring. <laughs> Where's that? Please come, come, come stand up. Please. And uh, Mr. Gilberto. Thank you very uh, much. We'll let you do the, do the discussion, and then we have a nice presentation. Yes, we do. So I will do just a brief overview. Lynn, welcome. <laughs> Thank you for being here uh, this evening. We have a, a large group to wish yep. you well. <laughs> <laughs> Some of you may have, or your children may have benefited from programs that Ms. Clemens has run over the years. Um, uh, again, she's retired from her position as recreation director. And uh, some folks in the room were here earlier today for a, um, a small gathering to wish her well from her coworkers here in the town hall and from members of the recreation committee. Um, Lynn is uh, retiring uh, after 16 years of service uh, with the town as an employee of the recreation department, plus an additional four years as a, an instructor uh, uh, by contract as well. So she has 20 years of experience uh, helping uh, children here in North Reading in her capacity <coughs> with the Parks and Recreation Department. Um, there's folks here from the Recreation Committee and former employees of the Recreation Department as well, who I thank for coming out this evening and were also here earlier today. Just a couple of notes for myself with regard to Lynn. Um, I will just note that Lynn is um, always, uh, in my experience, which is eight years working with her, been very passionate about the department and on behalf of the department and the people that it serves. Um, and uh, has uh, always uh, advocated uh, among the best of the boards, departments, and committees we have here in town and, uh, and has been often successful um, to the benefit of the many folks who benefit from recreation programming. And then the only th other thing that I will just note is that in, um, at the worst of the, at, during the worst of the pandemic, in 2020, uh, it was Lynn who was working to restore programming for the community um, to the point that um, almost a year ahead of many departments, we had recreation programming up and running here in North Reading because of her work, because of her ability to, co to work collaboratively with other folks, including the health department here in town. And we were able to offer services for our community when many communities were not able to. And that was almost exclusively because of Lynn's efforts. So Lynn, we wish you well. Thank Congratulations. you. Congratulations. And uh, thank you for your service. Mr. O'Leary, comments, comments. questions? No. <laughs> How's the budget going to do this year? I have nothing to do with it. Now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if there's any problems, call me on Friday. <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, I mean, I know Lynn uh, as a parent because our kids are the same age and was in the, met on the soccer fields and uh, recreation programs throughout the years in, in North Reading. And when she had the opportunity to join the recreation department, she was excited, but I was excited as a parent and as a <coughs> resident that she had an interest in it. I mean, her creativity, her, um, she just exudes excitement. And, and as it's proven over the years here, she's been very successful in coming here and making the pitch to, to, the, to the board and to the finance committee, and we've just seen the, uh, the programming grow exponentially. We've seen it, the outreach to the entire community, not just kids, you know, when we thought recreation, you always thought kids, and it's not. We've got adult programming, we've got, uh, which has been expanded significantly under uh, Lynn's guidance and you know, with a lot of assistance well, from these people who are sitting over here. So it's, uh, I'm personally very happy for you, uh, you, but I'm happy for the community that you were here and you spent the 20 years, uh, you've been in, your excitement is infectious. Your creativity is unmatched, and uh, you're going to be missed. But uh, you've made your mark, Thanks. and we're greatly appreciative Thanks of all that you've done. Much. 
So, thank you. I'll just add, um, as Steve said a lot of what I would have said, which is if you look at the quarterly flyer that you send out, um, you know, it has expanded, it has included more adults. I'm amazed that, you know, for the little bit of staff you do have, how much you're able to keep up in the air and keep it going. And it's been a regular steady diet of programming going on. So the town is tremendously better <coughs> from it. Um, I will say something that Steve didn't say, though. I, I always love the spring wine and uh, we miss, uh, you know, we missed that the last few years. Taste, taste <laughs> event. I mean, that was the go-to event to go to, yeah. and it was always for the right cause. You were trying to, uh, you know, you were trying to um, um, do an intergenerational community center, which is what it turned into, and you've always tried to raise funds for that purpose, and that's still a project in the process. And so, you know, thanks for leaving us with this type of legacy. I was hoping to see that community center before I left. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when it opens. I hope to hear about yeah, it. Yeah, when it opens, you know, we'll have to have you come back. But uh, no, thank you, Lynn. We've thank known you. each other for a good 10 years yes. now, and we've done a lot of things together. <clears throat> you know, delighted for your retirement. Thank you. And uh, wish you well going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Struville. Well, we never got to meet because I was just, you know, I'm a, a product of, uh, you know, first year in the office in COVID. I know. <laughs> However, I heard of how great you did because I have little kids in sports. So when everybody went uh, to outdoor activity, it became unfortunately your task to assign who gets to go where. 17 soccer teams and 20 baseball teams and everybody just looking for grass and um, <coughs> just how you were able to deal with everyone getting some square footage to throw a ball around, I think it was difficult at times. I mean, sometimes we show up for baseball practice and we had to kind of throw the ball near the yoga people. But, um, Those are our yoga people. <laughs> I'm there for the kids. So, um, but I know it was difficult because you can't please everybody. So that's why I knew that whatever at the helm of Parks and Recs was probably trying to balance the best they could with no one wanting to go indoors for activity. So, I can thank you for that, even though we never got to uh, meet. So, um, yeah, great job. And hopefully whoever takes over can manage the uh, minefield this coming spring. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Gonzalez. Hi, Lynn. Hi. Um, yeah, so Lynn and I know each other outside of all of this. And um, we've just been so lucky to have you. That personality, like Mr. O'Leary said, is just perfect for your role. Um, and it's a big loss. And I know that you've got a good team we behind do. you. We do. We are, we're confident. But um, it's a big loss, and we'll miss you. And you've done a fantastic job. And just thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I'm probably just going to be repeating everything that everyone said. But the <coughs> Parks and Rec, that team, the team that we, we, we have huge upheaval losing Maureen. Thank God Maureen you so are sticking muted. with us. But we wish you the best in your retirement, but we also thank you for everything you've brought to the town and becoming a member of this community. Parks and Rec is one of the places that you know you feel like you've got a sense of belonging to the community, and we really appreciate everything that you've brought to the table. When we go to all of these events, you're always there. You are unmuted. You're always working behind the scenes. I know you played a, a, a pivotal role in helping make the wall of the heels happen and bringing that to our town and coordinating all the things like that with our team. So all of that, all of those regular events that you've done with the Parks and Rec Department, all of the extra effort that you've done, it's, it's really invaluable to make in this town and community together and we really appreciate it. We wish you the best. Thank you. We hope we still see you around. <laughs> because of the program that you've developed and we have this plaque to present to you which is to say presented to lynn clemens in recognition of her 16 years of dedicated service to the town of north reading as recreation director given by the select board on behalf of a grateful community march 28 2022 with a picture of Rexon. thank you <laughs>
Yeah, say cheese. <laughs> <laughs> Nancy, he said say pickle. <laughs> Thank you. I do want to say thank you to my kid. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I'd like to say a quick thank you um, because, as you heard from everyone, I fight for our department all the time. So I do want to thank Mike. I really appreciate, especially this last meeting we had, and you acknowledging what the department means and where we need to bring them up to. I really appreciate the work that went into that. And to the select board hearing us every year coming to you and fighting for what we need, I appreciate everything you ever gave back to us because it. Um, it really helped us as a department to do the things that we love doing and to do what we love giving to the community. Um, and I mentioned earlier in my town um, party that we had that um, honestly, like my job has been an absolute pleasure to have for 20 years. I couldn't have found a job I loved any more than the one I had. Um, the community has sent me emails and letters and texts and it's just been wonderful <coughs> to hear. Um, I've heard from parents of little kids, I've heard from parents of students that work for me and um, you know what a great experience they had just working for us as counselors and that was such a joy to hear from parents. Um, I worked with a great group of co-workers. I learned volunteerism from my committee who was an amazing committee. I never knew I loved volunteering so much. <laughs> um, I am one of the crazy people that loved going to the barbecue and working every week. I actually loved being at the Disney character breakfast and the wine and food social. I enjoyed it all because it just brought me in deeper to the community and I just love this community. I live here, work here, and volunteer here and it's been amazing. Um, so I just want to thank um, the select board, my co-workers, and certainly the community because it's been just an amazing ride. So thank you. As we're uh, transitioning, I would like to introduce Nancy Racino, who is going to be the new recreation director. Um, she's a familiar face, currently doing our programming. Welcome. Thanks. Great. So congratulations, Nancy. Thank you very much. She's got it. Yeah. I can't get to it. Because that corner, you can ask someone to switch it. Thank you. Marty, it's hard to hear. Everyone can't hear. I have a little other noise. So if you can project a little bit louder, that'd be great. I asked a few of my neighbors to come by and swap me my first picture. <laughs> 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 I showed up. <laughs> Well, you want to do you want to dim the lights? That's good. No, it's, uh, I think we're okay. So um, it's nice to see everybody here in person with our masks on for, for uh, a little while. Um, thanks for having us here this evening. This is my first foray into the uh, presentation. Um, cut back with Paul, the Queen, Maureen, I had run it for so long, but uh, I learned from the best, so hopefully you all set. Um, we have the uh, North Bay Parks and Recreation. And, um, thank you for the support of our committee that shows up. Um, and I'm just going to try and go through this pretty quickly. Um, this is 
Just toggle with the arrow. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You might have to click on the presentation again. Oh, nice. I told you it was my first time. Love well, this slideshow. <laughs> so who are we? We are the Parks and Recreation uh, Department. Um, this is a little uh, organizational chart of uh, how we uh, who works with us. Um, we have the uh, the answer to the town administrator, and then um, we have a Parks and Rec committee who's uh, phenomenal. Um, most of them have been here for many, many years. Um, living with the same thing. There's a lot of people that are hoping to get an intergenerational center someday. Um, I'm Marty Tilton, I'm the Parks Director. I'm the Department Head, particularly for Chlorine. And um, Maria Brown is the new Operations Director. She's right here. And you just met Nancy Orsino, who's the Recreation Director. Um, under her, you can see there's an Administrative Assistant. Um, and under the Recreation Director, there's a new program of um, hopefully they can be just filled the position or above the position this week, so we're trending uh, it's, it's moving seamlessly with the transition. It's been tough uh, with all the uh, recent retirements. I don't know if it was something I said. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> this is how it breaks down. I mean, um, as a park director, I have a parks woman and a maintenance craftsman, and then we do employ uh, three seasonal personnel each uh, summer for college kids which we haven't due to COVID, we haven't had in the last couple of years, and um, it's made a huge difference on the little things, the normal stuff, the little things that we get, uh, try to get done. Um, so I'm a little bit of catch-up role, but we're gonna get there. So the recreation program offerings you see here, like uh, Lynn built this up before I know when I was a kid in the recreation program, we just run down the path to the school and it was free time, play time, but now it's grown to, you can see the flies, all the pro numerous programs that we have is uh, unbelievable. Um, Summerscape is a very uh, successful program. Um, we run sports clinics, science classes, everything like that, special events. Um, and I'm sure, like I said, a lot of you people, a lot of you kids have uh, participate, participated. <coughs> a little shy of uh, Summerscape. This was pre COVID, I hope. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was in your house. Actually, last year we were in that um, So, our responsibilities are uh, we permit and schedule out the Kennedy Field, all the youth fields, all the park facilities, which is a lot, and um, entails about, we have about 93 acres of grass to mow. Um, last year, with all the rain, we would mow every day. <laughs> um, special projects coming up. Um, I want to thank uh, Representative Jones for securing a hundred thousand uh, dollar grant that uh, we plan to do uh, <coughs> improvements in that secure park. Um, park's over 25 years old, so there's uh, things that need a little upkeep um, that we're going to hopefully be able to address this year. Um, along with the committee, we're going to come up with the best way to maximize um, the efforts of that. Um, these are the parks we take care of, um, along with uh, we uh, supplement the uh, school department. Um, we take care of the hood school baseball field, um, and in the summertime, the little school softball fields. So this is uh, what we're projecting for our revenues this year. Um, and we are asking for uh, the subsidy request for the uh, three directors this year and um, another portion of the uh, Parks Maintenance Craftsman. Um, as you can see, it's less, a little bit less than last year. A lot of that's due to um, the retirement changes of positions. So um, there's a few of the savings there. So you can see our expenses. The personnel has gone up, but not lose not so much with the directors. It's more so um, uh, minimum wage has gone up. So we have a lot of seasonal help um, and all the uh, recreation um, staff programs. Um, 
and all the things that were the um, minimum wage is brought up fifteen dollars so we have to show them that um, supplies have been brought down um, and the charges uh, expenses really haven't gone up that much just bumped up a little So here's a summary of, you can see where we're at. Um, again, we we're looking for the uh, three positions to be subsidized by the uh, town, um, and that's a huge help um, for us so we can uh, raise funds to keep making improvements and keep the upkeep for the parks and keep, keep the programs going on and make every um, necessary uh, change we need. So if I'm reading this correctly, your budget request this year is four thousand dollars less than your budget request from last year. Correct. Do we have any questions, Mr. O'Leary? Nope. Just a comment that they, again, aside from all the programming you're reaching the entire community, but what you've been able to do as far as maintaining <coughs> the parks and fields over the last couple of years, when they've been utilized more than ever, has been phenomenal. You've done a terrific job and serve the community well, but I appreciate your efforts. Thank you. And uh, yeah, the entire community does, so thank you. Thank you. Mr. Waller. Same here. Yeah, everything's been going good. Thanks for keeping your budget under control, and uh, you know, good luck for next year. Thank you. Mr. Studo, Mrs. Gonzalez. Good? Now this is the Finance Committee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well done, Marty. Thank you. Well done. Well this is your main one. <laughs> so, folks, if you could, I believe they're going to be leaving. If you could just make some room there, there might be some seats for you to come and enjoy them. Just going to get the seat <laughs> Might be a little while. Are they on uh, CBC on? Zoom? No, I saw one. No, on there. I saw Mark, 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 we get CPC coming in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We just pull up. <laughs> We're going to be brief. Um, the proposed um, FY23 CPC budget is a level services proposal, and as requested, I will be focusing only on changes and issues in my presentation. <coughs> the CPC would like to uh, continue working with engineering to update subdivision and site plan review regulations to ensure consistency with the town's MS4 permit. $5,000 in small capital funding was granted last year, having been put on hold um, in 2020. We have recently put a firm under contract to complete the most important parts of this work, but with the passage of time, the costs are now expected to be $10,000 for the entire project. This year's request of an additional $5,000 would allow us to complete all aspects of the review. Um, if we don't get that, we'll just continue to focus on the most important aspects of the project. <coughs> Um, <clears throat> this next piece is just with regard to the EDC. Um, continued support of the town's economic development initiatives is proposed with the budget for the Economic Development Committee um, within our professional services budget. The amount requested for this year is $20,000, um, as it was in prior years. Um, last year was an exception, with no new funding <coughs> requested because $15,000 of previous funding was carried forward into FY22. 
These funds were spent on a partnership with the Chamber of Commerce to encourage patronage of local businesses through the Shop the Writings campaign, as well as business networking, um, a business networking event in June. Um, the EDC would like to continue planning similar activities for the coming year, and so has brought back its funding requests to the level asked for in previous years. Additional projects anticipated include outreach to business and property owners, analysis of available properties in town, market analysis, new business recruitment, and consulting support for the disposition of selected underutilized properties um, to bring them into productive reuse. Business outreach events associated with the sewer proposal are also likely to be an important part of the EDC's activity plan for the year. The professional services other line item includes the estimated fee for membership in the Regional Housing Services Office, which is estimated to be up to um, $14,500 in FY23. This amount is expected to increase slightly each year, though the increase this year is expected to be a little bit larger due to the change in service model from full-time staff to consulting. An RFP for these services um, has just gone out, um, and depending on the result, the costs may be lower. Each of the five participating communities are being asked to budget for a maximum of $14,500 this year, but if actual costs negotiated are lower, uh, the full amount will not be needed. And those are all of the changes um, to our budget. I'd be happy to answer questions about anything else. Perfect. All right, questions? Mr. O'Leary? None. Mr. Waller? <laughs> no, the, the change, the regional uh, effort to bring in some regional resources makes total sense. Like, we see the towns more interacting all the time, so I think that's great and great to say uh, cost savings as well. It's a good way of having best practices and you've always been very responsible for your budgets in the past. Carry on. Thank you. Mr. Studo, Mrs. Gonzalez, to the Madam Finding Committee, any questions? How can you question that? Level services, right? Thank you, Danielle. Okay, <coughs> our next uh, order of business is the MBTA community uh, housing Danielle, can you give us a sense of how long you think that presentation will be? About 10 minutes. Okay. And um, it's, a, it's a bit fortuitous that everybody's here for this one, because I think it's an important one for members of the community yeah. to, be, to be aware of. <coughs> so take it away. And our, do we have a presentation? I do. That one you do. All right. There's a, in our packet that we receive in advance of the meeting, there's quite a bit of material <coughs> for this particular item. So um, it's unusual for us to have this brief discussion about budgets, but we're getting level services budgets. So there's really not much to go back and forth on the most part for those of you that are in attendance. So usually there's a lot more dialogue about different things, but what we've asked this year is for the park the departments to streamline and the reason why we're going through the department budgets first we know you're probably here on rail trail is because these people these folks have been here all day and they're you know hanging and waiting for us to get through the business so they can go home too so we really appreciate your sticking here there's a couple of things that you're here for so it's, it's good fortune that you're here to hear this one i think <coughs> Is this microphone okay as it is? If you can draw it closer to you because people are having a difficult time hearing you. We can just hold this side. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Danielle. A of the Zoning Act was signed into law in January 2021, and in early 2022, DHCD re released draft guidelines for communities, including MBTA adjacent communities with no service within their borders, such as North Reading, to have at least one zoning district that allows multifamily zoning by right, with no age or bedroom limits, of a gross density of at least 15 units per acre. The district must be 50 acres, mostly but not entirely contiguous. The guidelines are not yet final. Towns may comment um, through March 31st. A draft of my suggested comments has been provided to you. Oh, audio issue? Okay, is this better? No. No? It doesn't work. 
The microphone doesn't work. Oh, it's gonna try to. Oh, yeah. Okay. No. I can talk louder. I don't know. Can you? I can. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do that. Okay. So we can actually. Would you like me to start again? No. 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 Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We can summarize a new zoning law went into effect to provide for multi-family housing and we're an adjacent to community which means we don't have MBTA service here but we're a community that's adjacent actually Reading and Wilmington and I think Andover we're adjacent to communities that do have it and therefore we still qualify to comply in order to be able to access grants some grant funding which is some grant funding that, that means something to the town because we've accessed it before to pay for things like roadway improvements. So Danielle is just explaining to us what this new legislation means and what we would have to do as a town in order to implement the requirements of the legislation. So take it away, Danielle. Okay. Um, the state's guidelines are not yet final. Towns may comment on the draft through March 31st. A draft of my suggested comments has been provided to you and I will summarize them at the end of the presentation. If there are additional comments you would like to add, I will be submitting the town's comments on Thursday, March 31st. Full guidelines are also posted on the town's website and have been provided to you. I'm going to review them and discuss how they apply to North Reading. The consequence of not, not complying with the new statute is becoming ineligible for funding for three of the state's competitive grant programs. MassWorks, which the town anticipates applying for to offset costs related to sewer. Housing Choice, which we are not currently eligible for, but may become eligible for in the next few years based on our residential permit activity. And Local Capital Project Funds, which we are not eligible for. The guidelines also currently state that compliance status may come into decisions about other grants at the discretion of DHCD staff. Our goals for this meeting are to <coughs> stay compliant for the time being by holding this required public meeting during which the guidelines are explained. This is a requirement for staying compliant this year. I will review the timeline for staying compliant, including our next milestones. I'll give an overview of the ways our zoning bylaw is expected to fall short of compliance. However, a more in-depth discussion about how to address each of the issues that make us non-compliant is something we should wait until the final guidelines are released later this year for and um, until we've had a chance to do a more detailed analysis. At that time, we can discuss what zoning changes might be appropriate in order to ensure the town remains eligible for the funding that I mentioned. I don't think we'll be in a position tonight to make any decisions about what to do. As you can see on this map, North Reading is categorized in the new statute as an MBTA adjacent community. There is a set of rules for communities in each of these categories, including where a suitable multifamily district must be located and the number of multifamily units it must allow in that district by right. Because North Reading does not have any land area within half a mile of a train or bus station, we are not required to have our district within half a mile of transit as other communities are. However, we are still required to have a district. We are required to have a zoning district of, quote, reasonable size, which is at least 50 acres or multiple districts of five acres each, adding up to 50 acres, or um, an end that's combination must include at least one 25 acre plus parcel. Uh, sorry, one 25 acre plus district, which allows multifamily housing by right. Multifamily is, de is defined as three or more units per structure. The minimum gross density will need to be 15 units per acre. The zoning needs to allow a capacity of at least 750 multifamily units by right. The focus of the statute is on what the zoning allows, not necessarily what will be built, and there is no production requirement associated with this. Land needs to be developable to count, and zoning can't restrict age or number of bedrooms. North Reading zoning law currently does not comply, though as we can discuss in greater detail at a future meeting, there are several possibilities for how zoning changes can be approached so that the town does comply. <coughs> to be in compliance, the zoning district needs to meet certain criteria. As I mentioned, the requirement to be half a mile from transit is not possible to meet in North Reading, so another suitable location is required. This location is supposed to have reasonable access to transit and or comply with the state's sustainable development principles. We have a large multifamily overlay zoning district covering several properties, including Martin's Landing and Edgewood properties on Lowell Road. 
This is a good candidate for a suitable zoning district, but it would need some changes to the zoning <coughs> in order to become compliant. This would include eliminating the special permit requirement for site plan review in this district. Um, site plan review could still be done, but we would not be able to require a special permit in association with it as we do now. There would also be substantial areas of this district that would not count due to wetlands, flood zone, and public park use. Eligible districts must also be free from restrictions on age, number of bedrooms, and number of inhabitants. Other than the senior housing overlay on Park Street, none of North Reading's districts have such restrictions. Eligible zoning districts need to have a gross minimum density of 15 units per acre. While the housing at Martin's Landing in Edgewood is built at a high density, substantial open and undevelopable portions of that zoning district will result in a much lower density yield. Our eligible district would also need to have capacity for 750 units. Martin's Landing and Edgewood could potentially provide this if that district can be made eligible. The age restriction at Martin's Landing is not due to zoning, so it is possible that that area will count, but, a more, de but more detailed guidance is still needed from the state. For this year, interim compliance is achieved by holding today's public briefing on the new draft guidelines, <clears throat> submitting the MBTA community's information form online indicating whether we <coughs> believe we comply, but we would like technical assistance, oh, whether we would like technical assistance to achieve compliance, and basic information about our zoning districts and who will be the point person for compliance. This is due May 2nd of this year. By the end of 2022, we either have to apply to the state for a determination of compliance or we have to notify the state that we know we are not in compliance. This is due December 31st this year. The next steps after that will be submitting an act action plan for compliance due July 1st, 2023, and then finally adoption of any zoning changes, which would be due by December 31st of 24. This is just a summary of all the milestones we are highlighted as an adjacent community at the end. These are just the dates that I just mentioned. Um, and finally, I have uh, my recommendations for comments to be submitted. The following summarize the comments that I have drafted, um, which you should have in your packet. Um, as you will see, two of these are pertaining to bus communities, and they don't apply to North Reading, but I felt they were important to include since they impact our greater Boston region as a whole, including our neighboring communities in Reading and Wilmington. In the comments, I have called for consistency between the definitions for multifamily between the new statute and 40R. Currently, they are inconsistent, so it's not an automatic guarantee that 40R districts count. In fact, most of them will not. Um, in, L the, in making eligible a zoning district which contains a single large development, which is currently not allowed. Confirmation of how existing structures would factor into the analysis of minimum gross density and unit capacity. Availability of technical assistance in the land analysis for all communities, not just a few selected, um, the state has made known that only a few grants will be available. Um, questioning of why unit production reporting is necessary when there is no production requirement. Um, clearer definition of the expansion of grant program ineligibility as a result of noncompliance, which is at the discretion of DHCD staff. Um, it's one thing to know which grant programs we will not be eligible for, but it's another to say any grant program in the future um, you know, could potentially impact us. Better definition, consistency, and clarity in the categorization of communities, especially when more than one transit mode exists, and the eligibility of the land area around bus stops, which again, do not apply to North Reading, but um, I felt it was important to include. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, Mr. O'Leary, questions? <coughs> Just, um, was our legislative <coughs> delegation in favor of this proposal that was signed into law, do you know? I don't recall it. I don't know. I don't. Uh, was the Planning Commission even asked by our legislative delegation in relation to what the proposal, proposed guidelines, proposed law were going to do and how it would impact us? Because I don't recall being asked. <laughs> and this is a significant uh, change to uh, Mass General Laws and requirements on communities whereby. We were, I don't know how we're going to be able to comply. Let's put it that way. Right. Well, we were we were informed that this was coming, so we knew that they were going to be sending us the money, and, you know, but we didn't know what was going to be in it until we actually got it. Until after it was passed. Yeah. After it was enacted. Yeah. Yeah. 
that's of concern. And we didn't have any but, input into it. I, that's what you asked. Yeah, Did they asking. come to us and ask for input? I don't know if they came to any communities and asked for input. I think they just put this together as a result of the high need for housing. They're trying to solve their problem. There is a significant need, and, and, yeah. and as a community, we have an obligation to help exactly. meet those needs. Uh, <laughs> but I don't know how we can ever come into compliance with this in the near future, or even in the distant yeah. future. I, if I may, but, okay. yes, I, don't, I don't know that we need to make that decision just yet, because the rules aren't clear yet. When they finally give us all of the, what, what the rules are, and she outlined a couple of those items, for example, you know, what exactly grants will we not be eligible for, and, and, and also what, how we can make what we have compliant. Because we do have a, a lot of, uh, of uh, housing out here that we've developed. I mean, the, we have a couple of, couple of parcels out here, yeah, so that, 62. Yeah, the very property that we've developed under 40R, so that if we, if right. we convert that zone, we do something for that mm -hmm. zone, maybe if we include that in this, and we may actually get compliant. We don't know yet. We don't have enough information. Yeah, I mean, this is of extreme concern in relation to the density, you know, 15 mm -hmm. units per acre. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's obviously, we have a conscious decision to make if we're looking to come into compliance in order to be eligible for certain grant monies. And again, we've been uh, tremendous beneficiaries of grant monies, you know, $3 million for our water projects and all the rest through MassWorks, and now we may not be in compliance and eligible for these programs later on. We're talking about a major sewer project coming up that we're going to be proposing and hope the community supports. Um, how is that going to impact us? Um, <coughs> obviously, your comments are, are good and well-directed, mm -hmm. but in the short term, where we have these immediate needs and major capital expenditures that are being proposed, mm -hmm. it, it, I, I don't want to be, you know, what have you done for me lately? Because yeah. the state has been partnering and and Representative Jones and Senator Tarr have been good advocates for the town of North Reading, and we've been successful. But this legislation really could have a significant adverse impact on us and our ability to, to move forward. I guess that's where some of our comments should be directed towards and um, ask for assistance from our legislative delegation to, to assist us in getting the guidance and guidelines honed in so the community such as North Reading can somewhat be forced to come into compliance and meet the needs of the regional needs for housing? Because I don't believe we've done that yet. Uh, we need to do more. But this is somewhat draconian in relation to our ability to, to comply from what we can see from the surface right now. So that's a great concern. So not a question, comment. Well, tonight, well, tonight's meeting is a step in the process. It's a requirement that we, that we have a public meeting, that we inform everybody that you know, with as much information as we have. So that's the intent of tonight's meeting. It worked. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Waller, Mr. Holder, you all said? I'll thank Mr. you. Mr. Waller. No, it does seem draconian. I mean, it's very, you know, in, in, in so many different aspects, it's asking for information. It seems like already we don't have great answers for it. I know we don't know the <coughs> rules. You've done what you're supposed to do tonight. Mm -hmm. um, it's a question of how we move forward, um, you know. It's, it sounds complicated, and so I think probably the board would like to be kept up to date, like you're doing it now, mm -hmm. but as things transpire, as you find out new information, even if it doesn't <coughs> seem like it's worthy of the meeting, um, just some information on that would be good so we could follow this more closely, because it seems complicated, too, and I appreciate it for you, Danielle. This is uh, sorting it out. is very difficult, you know, so this one case, I'm glad we're not. Uh, you know, we're in an adjacent community, not directly in path, because my guess is their world is a lot more difficult than ours. Since we have a, a, a comment period before us still, I would encourage the board, if they redo this and they come up with some comments that they would like us to include in the comment period that we turn. To, uh, to I do, but we're, that's what we're doing right okay. now. We're going to give them to you now because the deadline is two days from now. So yeah. there is commentary. We have to give it to you now. That's the whole purpose of us meeting. Um, Mr. Studo. Uh, and now you mentioned transit lines is one of the requirements or you said transit lines. What does that mean? Because then I guess we're exempt or? We are exempt from having a zoning district near a transit line. Those communities that have transit stops in their communities have to locate their district within a half mile. 
because we don't have any land that fits that description in our borders, we don't have to meet the location requirement. We have to have a district, but they, the state will sort of defer to us to decide where a suitable district is. And it's supposed to meet the state's sustainable development principles. It's supposed to be in a suitable area within reasonable you know, walking distance and access to other services. I, I think there's a really good argument to be made that the, the properties on Lowell Road are in pretty decent walking distance to a town hall and you know Main Street and you know it would, that, that was an approved area for a 40-yard district at one time. I, I, I that's as close as you can get in North Reading to a commuter rail station. So I I would make an argument that that should be a good location. Is there an exemption process for this? No. If they make no sense, so none at all. <laughs> well, the only not exemption yet. would be to not do it and then to lose the eligibility for the grant. That's a comment. That's one of oh. the, I have actually two okay. comments. Yeah. Okay, so okay, I'll give you some comments okay. to put in the comments. Because maybe part of where I'm looking at it is that it seems like this is something where if you don't have the T or you're reasonably close to it, unless you know 25 minutes to Wakefield, you know, there's walking distance, you know, or Uber, um, without an exemption mechanism, I feel like it was just passed in haste and it's kind of it just you know putting everybody together. I mean, that's like saying that. You know, is there a town an hour? Is there a town 45 minutes from Worcester that are considered adjacent communities like us and somehow they have to so, solve? So maybe that's a way to go. I don't know if they're still taking comments on whether or not some towns should be exempt, not because we don't want it, because there's no reasonable way this will ever make sense in North Reading, not unless by some miracle tomorrow we start having you know a bus stop next to the horseshoe. So. <laughs> A bus stop anywhere in this town would be lovely, but they won't give it to us. <laughs> Can't even get the ride in here. Um, so, if if it is just impossible, which we're feeling like it is, um, you're saying that there's there's no exemption. Like we cannot absolutely comply to this. They won't exempt us at all. I mean, I don't think we've just. We've totally determined that we can't comply. I think we, over the course of this year, should do some work to figure out whether we want to try to comply, and if so, what those zoning changes would look like. But if you can't comply, they've been pretty clear so far that the penalty is just to lose the grant funding, or the opportunity to compete for the grant funding. So. What's the timeline on that, Daniel? You know, like, because um, we're moving pretty fast with our sewer and our wastewater, I and mean, is there a, an end game that maybe we could beat the clock and not and get that grant money. Well, um, so staying in compliance this year means um, submitting our community information form by May 2nd, um, and then by the end of the year, notifying the state whether we believe we're compliant or not. Um, if we believe we're compliant, we're obligated to apply, make our case that we have the district, and wait for their approval within a few months. Um, we won't be compliant by December, so what we would be planning on doing would be notifying the state that we don't comply and then having a few more months to submit an action plan. Mm -hmm. And that action plan, um, that action plan is due July 1st of 23. Mm -hmm. And then the action plan then <coughs> we would take and have to pass any necessary zoning changes by December of 24. And mm -hmm. then apply for our district once zoning was passed, mm -hmm. assuming zoning was passed. All right, I have about seven additional mm -hmm. comments okay. being added to your list. <laughs> and I'm going to piggyback off of what my colleagues have just said. First of all, the deadlines themselves, every single community is dealing with this, so the deadlines themselves really have to be bumped out because they've, they've basically plopped it. They, they've plopped the legislation upon <coughs> communities and said, by the way, you're not going to get these grants and maybe other grants that they haven't even identified. That's very unfair and it's very inequitable. So not, comment number one would be these deadlines should be bumped out because it's unrealistic for every city in town to be able to do this, including the ones that have transit. And, and us, it's, it's probably actually a little bit easier for us because we can locate it wherever we can do an overlay district. But the fact of the matter is it's just going to be multifamily housing by right that's going to change quite a bit for the community and you have to prepare for the infrastructure needs related to that. So I would say number one, they need to bump out the, the, the legislators made an unreal 
realistic expectations, and they need to bump those out. The second thing, is, as is mentioned, is exemptions, but it should be waivers, Danielle. We should be asking them to put into their regulations the ability to file for waivers of these things for not only projects that are in process, like Mr. O'Leary mentions, but also for waivers because we're not even a recipient of services. So if we're, we're required to increase the housing stock like that, and we don't even have a bus coming by to take people where they need to go in our community, there should be some sort of either an exemption or a waiver written in. Then, then the next thing is to piggyback off of that, not just a waiver or an exemption process, but also uh, to, to go retroactively back in terms of, and you mentioned Danielle Edgewood and Martin Lanning. My understanding is they won't let you use what you have in place or in play. So even though Martin's Landing isn't full yet, and that could be part of the multifamily housing, we can't use that to show that we have the number of units. That was my understanding. I think it's possible that we can, but it's not crystal clear. That should be another yes. one of your comments. Make it clear. And further, there should be a, a, a retroactive period, even if it's just three years, a three-year look-back period for those communities like North Reading that have made great strides in, you know, improving the the housing stock. And we have we have a lot of we have a lot of things in the pipeline for improving our housing stock. And I don't know if that's enough time though. Three years back, it might need to be five years back <laughs> from our plan. But, but the stuff that's coming down, or coming online right now, should be in consideration if we decide that that's if we decide to go forward with this, and that's the district. And then um, that was my other question. I just had a, a question, and, and Leanne, uh, Mrs. Gonzalez, kind of mentioned it. So we already. We, we already are assessed a specific amount to to pay to the MBTA. What are they going to do to bring services in here to accommodate transportation when we've increased the when we've increased the housing stock <coughs> to such a degree, e even in just that one zoning district? What are they going to do in terms of accommodating that transportation need that's undoubtedly going to be created? I don't think they care. That's not really what, what, what they care about. But if we are going to be seeking grant funding, which we know we're going to need to, or some type of earmarks for drawing the paying for the sewer project, it's 100% likely going to be a quid, quid, pro quo, quid pro quo, where we're going to have to put housing along you know, the main corridors there. So. But that could be an overlay district if we're talking about apartment buildings in that area. So it's it's po it's quite possible to be done, but we need to have them make some sort of an ex you know at least ask for it in, in your comments. In addition to all the confusion and some of the things that seem pretty obviously that you've already identified that obviously need to be <coughs> refined in the in the legislation. So. But we're not alone. We're not the only community trying to sort it through. It's just maybe easier for us because we don't have to put it right beside the T-stop. We can put it anywhere. We can put an overall in it. So it's just what's the right area for that? <coughs> Madam Chair, just, just to piggyback a little bit, you know, with the density that's being proposed under this legislation, we don't have the capacity from a wastewater standpoint to support it. You can't put in septic systems to support that much housing and we don't have wastewater so we can't even come into compliance or even if we wanted to without wastewater you know so therefore you know there's a they put together this linkage program here this is what it is it's a linkage program to to promote more housing in this particular area and saying if you happen to be in this district around and they're using public transportation as the the linchpin here, but there's a linkage program in order to force communities, suburban communities primarily, um, to put more housing in close to, and again, help promote public transportation. But it's a linkage program here. We are not capable of complying 
because of the topography, the amount of wetlands, and what is left for buildable space here. How do they expect a community like North Reading to come into compliance? They need to kick out the, as the chair pointed out, they need to kick out this thing a little bit more so that these issues can be vetted and can be legislated appropriately. Can I applaud their efforts here? Uh, but it's been thrust upon the communities, and again, it, you know, it's been a year now since it's been signed into, into law. But there's no way that we can come into compliance just from a topographical standpoint, wetland standpoint, and what our requirement required needs would be in order to, to comply with this law. So how do they how do they assist our communities? I can't believe that legislators sitting up there, and there are a lot of legislators, the majority of legislators up there are not from urban communities. They're from suburban communities. And it's like most of the cities and towns of North Reading, like North Reading, are not going to be able to comply and therefore <coughs> render themselves ineligible for funding. And that's not, I don't believe that was the intent. It might have been for fewer people that attend to spur some action and discussion so that worked but in order to really make it work and to achieve what they're looking to do they need to they need to tweak it a bit and they need to push the deadlines out. any members of the CPC on, have any more other, other comment on it or or yeah, just, just a quick comment to Steve's comment there are towns like Reading who have the, uh, the, the rail service and everything there, but if they tried to implement this in their mm -hmm. downtown, it would, dis it would disrupt their entire down. They'd have to reconfigure their entire downtown. So they're unlikely to do it. So they're likely to take whatever uh, results are of not doing it. So we're certainly not alone, um, as you said. And I, and I think that probably, um, that hopefully with the comments that we put in and the comments that everybody else puts in, that they take another look at this and put some of these exemptions in for the communities that would be absolutely impossible. Uh, for, we, we actually have a little bit of a possibility, but but something like Reading or downtown Wood, it, it would be impossible for them to implement this. So I see some changes coming. We don't have all the rules yet. This is just the beginning information, and we hope that when the rules do come, they give us some room to move. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks for such a detailed presentation. Very helpful. Welcome. I'll submit these comments on uh, Thursday. All right, great. Okay. Anything else on that? Well, All set? Warren, thank you for running again. <laughs> Madam Chair, right. we do have joint appointments for the EDC. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. I'm sorry. <coughs> we, have, we have a. Yes, we do. It's a joint appointment. Right? Correct. Joint appointments roll call. Right? Yes. Good. Yes. Yes. Madam Chair, I move to jointly reappoint the following individuals to the Economic Development Committee for the terms and positions stated below. Two vacancies. David O'Neill, member through March 3rd, 2024. Thomas Olila, associate member through May 3rd, 2024. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo. Second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? This is a name, roll call vote. Mr. O'Leary. Mr. O'Neill and Mr. O'Leary. Mr. Walner. David O'Neill and Thomas O'Leary. Mr. Studo. David O'Neill and Thomas O'Leary. Mrs. Gonzalez. David O'Neill and Thomas O'Leary. Mean Kelly is David O'Neill and Thomas O'Leary. And Mrs. Yes. Pierce. Um, I will call you David Rama. Mm -hmm. That's just you. David O'Neill. Thomas. O'Leary. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And Mr. Hayden O'Neill. Mm -hmm. David O'Neill and Thomas O'Leary. Mm -hmm. And Warren Pierce is David O'Neill and Thomas O'Leary. All right. Okay. They're appointed. Moving in for everybody that's here. Okay. Um, do we, is that, that's, that's it for appointments. Okay. All right. Are you going to stick around for the real trail discussion by any chance? It's good stuff. You won't, Mr. Pierce? Okay. Thank you. <coughs> okay. Um, do 
So we have our, our next, uh, our next budget. Liz, are you, are you presenting for the Hillview? No, uh, Mr. Hatchie is here. Mr. Hatchie is. Fran Hatchie. Mr. Hatchie is here for the commission. If you want to join at the table, Mr. Hatchie. I'm sorry. Yeah, let's come on up to the table. Welcome. Uh, I assume that you all have copies of the budget that we have presented. Madam Chair, through you. Yes, Mr. In, Gilberto. In addition to uh, Mr. Hashi and Karen Moberg from the uh, Office of the Commission, the Chairman, Mr. Stack, is here by Zoom um, as well. Um, so I just want to. And the well, Treasurer, Peter Stack. Hemi. Oh, and Peter Hemi as well is also. And here. the Treasurer, Peter Hemi, also. Thank you. And Mr. Hemi, okay. I can't see that far away. So. <laughs> All right. All right. So uh, as you can see, that the. Mm -hmm budget that we presented to you pretty similar to what it was in the previous year. We don't see uh, any changes in a lot of the items that are, I think, four items or four line items that are a little bit different. Uh, you'll see a difference in the uh, capital expenditures of course, and equipment. It went from 250 to 400. And that's because we have <clears throat> decided that we needed to do some improvements in the course, which, uh, and the building, the function hall, with $100,000 for the function building and improvements. There's $25,000 allocated for drainage, $100,000 for improvement in safety of tea boxes, improvement in the bunkers. And one of the main items is the 100,000 for cock bath improvements. We've been getting a lot of wear and tear on the belt guards because of erosion problems in old uh, cock paths uh, that are in disrepair. So <coughs> that's the, uh, the difference in that particular line. Uh, let we have uh, a decrease in, in some of the uh, we anticipate utilities because we're going to have a, in the building, we're going to have a, a tenant now that's going to be overlooking a lot of the, the things that are happening in the building. So the maintenance should be on a better footing. Um, also, uh, Yeah, one of the things you'll see is the professional services, an increase of like $47,700. And that's due to the contractual obligations that we have with GFMI, who is the, the course uh, management company. Uh, other than that, uh, the budget is pretty much similar to what it was last year. Okay, questions. Any questions of the members of the board? Mr. O'Leary, all set? I don't have any questions. I'm pretty familiar with it. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Walmer? I'm good. Thank you. Mr. Studo, Mrs. Gonzalez, members of the Finance Committee, any questions? Yes. Mr. Sure. Palmer. I see uh, uh, a line for uh, payment in lieu of taxes and land utilization committee. Those are all zeroed out. Is that intended to be that way for an ongoing basis? Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Any follow-up questions? Any other questions? All set, Mrs. Herbert. Uh, yes, I am. I think this is a discussion that we've had over the last several years um, with both the town administrator and the OU Commission, as well as the Finance Committee. And I think our understanding is, um, among other things, that 
payment in lieu of taxes is not going to be made for the next several years. Um, and one of the things that has been looked at is uh, when their uh, bonds are, are completed, et cetera, for some of their projects. Um, and that um, uh, Major can reply as to when those are completed. But for the time being, I think whether we like it or not, the decision has been to have a hiatus temporarily on payment in lieu of taxes. Okay. Ms. Rourke, I do, do know that. Are you all set? You have your hand up. Are you okay? <clears throat> I just wanted to make uh, one note uh, to the discussion in regards to capital. Capital is funded within the capital plan and the capital budget, so it's funded outside of the operating budget that you have in front of you. You Coming weeks, you will uh, have the capital plan presented to you, and the items that were mentioned will be uh, addressed at Okay. All right. All set. Just a comment, Madam Chair. Just over the last, you know, couple of years, it's been certainly a challenge for the commission to uh, operate the facility. Well, golf was up because people could be outside and golfing, and that was fine. Uh, but the facility itself, of course, as we all know, um, the tenants that were there, the licensees that were there, were unable to operate, unable to uh, have function halls and all the uh, functions uh, within the function hall. So we now have a new tenant. I believe the contract has been signed. The contract has been signed so that, as Mr. Hatchie pointed out, um, we'll have a tenant who will be paying the utilities and helping to maintain uh, the cost of the, of the facility. The facility itself is in significant need of, of uh, capital improvements and presentations will be made at a future date. It is important for us to recognize that we need to continue to invest in this particular enterprise so that this enterprise can continue to invest in the community and what is returned to to this community has been tenfold. So uh, let us not uh, shoot the golden goose, so to speak, and let's uh, make sure that the commission is able to continue to invest wisely, maintain the facility, and then uh, continue to return to this community uh, a better way of life. So um, the commission, thank you for all of their efforts. And again, a significant amount of time and energy has been expended in trying to get the tenants in there to help just offset the maintenance cost. And, uh, of the facility, but also their foresight in try, trying to address uh, what needs to take place there going forward. And we'll have a discussion of that in a future <coughs> day. But again, thank you to the commission, and George, wherever you are, and Peter and the rest of the commission. We, we look very, very forward to this new occupant uh, at the upstairs function hall. They look like they're very progressive, so we, we, we think things are good things are going to happen in the future. Definitely, the town does look forward to that. We're all yeah. looking to see this place be a success and bring in more revenue for different things that we can do throughout the town. So absolutely, we, we want to see that that new tenant be a successful tenant. Get it from and Right, <laughs> having town events there. Resume the town events there. Absolutely. Be great, especially coming out of some of the restrictions now. So all oh. Before you go, hand raise, Mr. Kelleher. Speaking of, of the new tenant, is there an assumption in the budget about revenue from, from that new tenant? Is there an assumption in the budget about how much revenue will derive from that new tenant? So only a small you are portion. muted. Huh? Um, only a small portion because the contract wasn't signed until after the budget was submitted. Do we have so an there estimate? Is, there, is, there is a consideration for some utilities to go down. We're recognizing that the tenants were going to be paying utilities. You are unmuted, um, but until you know, we didn't have the contract signed with other Can you share with us what you expect it to be now, though, even though the budget has been prepared already? So the tenant will be taking over the utilities um, immediately for the building. And um, after a period of months, I believe it may be August, I'm not sure of the exact date, they're going to start paying um, a licensing fee, a monthly licensing fee. Tell him you'll, 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 share, you'll share with him the details. Yeah. I, I would, I would like to see what, what, what the impact is of that. I mean, is it, is it really, is it just taking over the, the utilities, which is wonderful because it keeps us from incurring those costs, but is there a positive impact 
and, and how much is it? You say that in August that will start. So it would be $3,500 a month starting in August. Okay. And so I believe right. after the first year, then they start doing um, a 3% revenue share. Mm -hmm. Correct. After the first year what? After the first year in business, they do a 3% revenue share where they provide 3% of their gross revenue oh, back. Yeah. Wait, exactly. after, after, the after the first year. After the first year. And they're signed on for a five-year lease. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kelleher, the, yep. Mr. Kelleher, the town administrator will be happy to share that she has a recent contract with the finance committee. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. change that I made to it this year is uh, uh, for uh, a new lease of a POSIT machine uh, for the PSA maintenance. The POSIT machine we have now, we purchased in 2012, and um, we can no longer get a service agreement for it because the meter is so old that they will not service it anymore. So that was the only change that I have in the budget is for a new POSIT Okay. <coughs> Pretty straightforward. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Any questions? Important to have postage to yes. mail out the bills, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and paychecks and W two. And paychecks and W two. All set. Yeah, this, is, <laughs> oh, this, is yeah, this is highly unusual, but we appreciate the conciseness of the presentation. Anything else, Liz? Or? No, that's all that's All right. Thank you, Marianne, for a great job. Thank you. Yes. And all of Marianne's staff as well. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. <coughs> all right. Now we have our assessor. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening to you all. I'm um, just going to address my budget on change line items where it's getting late, unless you want to discuss anything different. The only line item on my budget that is not level funded is the professional services. And the difference with the, the increase with the professional services is due to the fact that we do have the real estate and personal property interim adjustment this year that we do have to have a certified tax rate and values. The reason it was not in my budget last year is because we had a full revaluation and we went through the RFP process. So that's the increase in my professional services. The dues and membership, that's our new state, our new camera system. Their dues or subscription fees are higher than what we're used to seeing. That's it. Questions? Mr. Oler, Mr. Sudo, Mr. Walmer. Just, just a quick comment. Did comment. I see? Did I see that we're now doing drafting or something for paying bills? Did I see that on the website? Drafting. Uh, where people can connect up, they can have their bills automatically paid through the bank. Did I, did I misunderstand that? No. Yeah, not my wheel. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <Never mind. laughs> uh, sorry, I'm not there. You yeah. must decide that for right now. Wait a minute, Mary Ann just lost. <laughs> there you go, sorry. All right. All good. All set. Mrs. Gonzalez, all set? All set. Members of the Finance Committee, all set? All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have IT next. It's Liz. Oh, Liz. Oh. Okay. Oh, Liz. I'm here to uh, present the FY23 Information Technology Operating Budget. 
last year we lost our um, IT director to another community um, and we chose after searching for a, a new director to go in a different route as we received um, no applicants. So we moved forward with contracted services uh, with Delphi technology and um, that has worked out really well. Uh, we still have our in-house um, IT assistant who has been acting uh, IT director for the time that the position has been vacant. And the system is working out really well for us. And we're having everything you know, brought up to date, up to speed, and um, we are going to continue with that model for another year and see where that brings us and see if uh, the market's better to go out and, and search for um, a new IT director at that point. So you'll see that there's a decrease in personal services, but then there's an increase in professional services. The other increase in professional services data processing would be driven by the increase that Tyler Technology charges us um, annually for our support fees, which is um, our financial management system, our tax billing system, our water billing system. So it, it does it all. So that's a 5% increase. There's other small uh, increases here and there, and that's just due to uh, cost inflations for computer supplies. And um, also, there is a slight adjustment to telephone. We pay the telephone bills, and this is not cell phone bills, this is telephone bills um, of all of the town buildings, and so, or municipal buildings, I should say. So we are just bringing that budget line up uh, to true costs. Question, comments, Mr. O'Leary. None, thank you. Mr. Walner, mm -hmm. Mr. Studo, Mrs. Gonzalez. I'll just say, I think it's veering into the wrong direction. I think we, we need to really shore up this staffing, and we really need to expand what IT is doing here. I mean, we have our TA that's our basically our IT director, and that, that simply shouldn't be the case. He's our website manager. He, it just We need really need to bring on, we even have competent people in the community that have the professional competencies mm -hmm. we need. We really need to, expand this department and move it forward and, and not be expecting the I, TA to be troubleshooting things. That's I 100% agree with you. So, so veering off into Tyler and Delphi, I think it's, it's just temporary fix and things like that, but we exactly. really need to have people in-house in house mm -hmm. in, in working with, in, in, you know, even just kind of across the town mm -hmm. working with you know, school, police, fire, whatever set up here for the infrastructure and, and to be able to have people, even in emergency, even in COVID, we really needed this to be a, a full-fledged actual life. <coughs> right, so. and, and we were all scrambling, you know, all the yes. heads. So, yes. and a few years back, we did try to add another staff member who would assist with, um, you know, the website and anything else, other things like that. Um, but with budget constraints, we were unable to um, move forward with that. So it's something that we definitely need to sit down and, and look at the structure. Yes, mm -hmm. it needs a lot, mm -hmm. even just for emergency, resiliency, and just basic needs of the town. So I'd like to see it shift back, but I'm only one of four, so um, comments of the finance team. All set? Questions? You're good? All right. But while I had no questions, I concur with the chair. I think we have yeah. Questions yeah. and comments. Yeah. I know. We're yeah. trying to streamline. We're trying to streamline. We appreciate you streamlining. <laughs> you're, not even the IT, you're not even the IT person in here giving us the IT report. You might as well go into the next, <laughs> right. into the next category. Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll move on to uh, finance and accounting. 
So within the finance uh, operating budget holds uh, my salary and uh, the assistant finance director's salary as all that is uh, housed there. Um, and within the accounting budget, we will be seeing later on um, an appointment to an outside auditor, and so there has been a slight increase in professional services accounting, which is the line item that um, pays for the outside audit services. And the other item under personal services is a clerical increase, and you're seeing this across all um, municipal departments that have clerical uh, staff, uh, the NRAS uh, union, where the contract was settled. So it's uh, truing up that you know, as a compounding impact, and that's what that increase uh, signifies. Okay, questions? Comments and questions? Mr. O'Leary? Nope. Mr. Walner, Mr. Scudo, Mrs. Gonzalez, I just have a comment. You wear many hats. Yeah. You're an amazing part of the administrative team here, and this is our opportunity to tell you how much we appreciate you and all that you do for the town. So thank, thank you. I appreciate that. All right, so from the finance committee, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you. Next is public safety. Are we having anyone join us? Or you no, I'll, I'll be handling the next You're five. Right. The next five will be mine. All right. Uh, next five. Yes. All right. I'll bring, I'll bring it home. Are you going to present them all at once? I'll do, them, I'll do them all at once, honestly. And um, there's there's not a whole lot, I think, for discussion. And uh, if you want, Madam Chair, I'll just go through each of them and then we can take questions collectively. Perfect. Okay. Is that all right? <coughs> My colleagues in the National Finance? So, all right. Just a high level overview public safety administration. This is a department that we established by vote of the board, um, I think, five years ago now. And uh, continues to be recommended to be funded um, at the uh, amount of the uh, stipend of the public safety director. So there's no change in that budget for fiscal year 2023. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. <clears throat> Public Services Administration. This is a new department established by vote of the select board in January this fiscal year. And we are currently advertising for the position of director of public services. This budget uh, would include um, at this stage only an appropriation for the salary for that position which has been advertised for a range of eighty dollars to $100,000, and we've budgeted at this time $100,000, and we'll adjust that depending upon the outcome of that hiring process. And we've limited the request for that, um, that department to just that salary at this point. For the town administrator's budget, uh, the uh, changes are contractual um, salary adjustments that are included within, uh, and then there is an uh, increase in um, travel for conferences uh, as part of uh, my request to uh, attend the International um, City County Management Association um, conference in 2023. Um, excuse me, 2000, yes, 2000, uh, the end of this year, 2022, fiscal year 2023. <clears throat> and uh, you, some board members may know, I, I, I don't generally go to that conference each year. It's uh, usually every couple of years that I go. So I put the request in this year and I'm hopeful to be able to recommend it uh, for funding at the end of the budget process. For the select board, um, I put in uh, additional funding for uh, any training or education that board members may wish to take as we kind of come out of the pandemic and there are more opportunities available. So I just want to let folks know anything that you're interested in learning more about that opportunity is there in the budget here. Um, um, the most common one is the MMA, the Mass Municipal Association. I'm sure you've been seeing more and more events are coming online and there will be more and more in-person events which do have a registration fee component. And then finally, uh, for town council, uh, I would just note um, that I recommended holding um, the appropriation level to uh, the appropriation amount for fiscal year 2020, um, one, uh, 20, 2022. Uh, we did see a spike during the course of this year, but it's related to a very specific uh, matter that we've been in uh, arbitration over, uh, which will not repeat itself uh, next year. So I do think that we are in good standing to recommend um, holding that level to the prior year's uh, dollar amount. And that concludes right. my presentation. Questions and comments? Mr. O'Leary. Nope. Mr. Walner. All good. Mr. Scudo. <coughs> Mrs. Gonzalez. <laughs> I'm going to say to you as well, just the comments of all that you do for the town, the work around the clock that you do for the town. It doesn't go unnoticed by the board. 
the general public might not understand all the things that you're struggling with. We, we do. So we appreciate all the efforts that you make for us. Appreciate that. Thank, so thank you. you. Thank you. Comments, questions from the audience? We're all set. Good. Yes. All right. Thank you. We have, you're here, so we have a, a update or Will that be Mr. Gilberto or Ms. Roth? Ms. Roth, you want to take do the update number seven? And while the, the, the finance director is uh, setting up at the computer, I think the members have seen uh, this is now the second version of the um, revenue and expense projection for fiscal year 2023. Um, finance, the financial planning team has been meeting and will continue to meet as we go through the budget process as we do each year to work to uh, resolve um, gaps between the requests <coughs> and the available funding uh, that we see every year and are again seeing this year. The finance director can provide some more detail uh, briefly this evening. Thank you. So quickly, I will go through um, the FY23 revenue and expense plan, which we reviewed on Friday with the financial planning team. We have another uh, financial planning team meeting this coming Friday, where we will look at other areas within the revenue and expense plan that we may be able to reduce, adjust, change, eliminate in order for us to begin the steps with balancing both the municipal and school budgets. So most of you are familiar with um, this, this format and I'm not sure if you have the PDF version of the revenue plan within um, your packet, but if not, I'll make sure that we get that there as well as this presentation. So this basically just walks you through the um, total taxes available and total state aid available. Madam Chair, three, we can act, if you don't mind turning those off, that would be really helpful. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, just, just the one on, just the, just this side. <laughs> so um, as you can see, uh, for FY22, we ended up uh, with new growth of almost a million one. And moving forward into FY23, we are having a similar amount of new growth, and we have broken out that new growth by regular new growth, which is additions to homes, renovations, rebuilds, teardowns, all that. And then we have 104 Little Road, Martin's Landing new growth. That brings us down to our total taxes, and then we have our estimated uh, state aid available to us, which is based upon a January figure. There has been some new news that we have received, and we will discuss on Friday at our financial planning team meeting if we will be updating the Chapter 70 and unrestricted general government aid uh, numbers. Up or down? We're, we're optimistic that yes. they'll be going okay. up, yes. yes. <laughs> oh. The numbers people never want to give a, a full commitment to that. So. <laughs> <laughs> local receipts and other financing sources. So local receipts, we are conservative in our estimates. We hope to surpass our FY22 local receipts uh, budget and we are looking still at the FY23 figures if there is any area within local receipts that we can adjust and, and bring up. Moving down to other financing sources, uh, probably three years ago we moved away from having all of the zero line items on the bottom be part of the other financing sources. Now they are a direct offset to the municipal budget um, but before they used to be part of the whole mix. So we are trying to reduce our reliance on the debt service stabilization fund. However, we use that fund to pay for debt service or capital items. Moving on to expenses, you will see that I have a few areas highlighted for FY23. One uh, section being the Northeast Regional School Assessment and the additional Northeast Regional School Capital. This is all something that we are aware of that took place as we had to go 
to the polls and, and vote this project as a few communities had voted this project down and it's for a um, new facility for Northeast uh, Regional School. And that brings that figure um, to about 656, I'm sorry, it's even small for me to see here. Um, 645, I believe, is the total. And that's the only area here that I will, oh, I will point out another area is debt service not exempt. Through the capital process and discussions with the financial planning team and the town administrator, we have chosen to increase what we carry for non-exempt debt service and bring that figure up to one point uh, one million two fifty. Small adjustment, but anything helps. Moving on down to the PFA health insurance contingency line item, I have that highlighted as we are carrying forward the FY22 budget figure and we are increasing that by 7.5%. Since uh, the beginning of FY22, we have been carrying uh, the health insurance budget as well as the PFA health insurance contingency figure at a 7.5% increase uh, off of FY22. And this historically has been how we have begun the budget process. So that also addresses the school health insurance and then municipal health insurance figures. They are FY22's <coughs> budget figures brought forward with a 7.5% increase. And then a quick but scary snapshot is where we are. Our total fixed costs are uh, 24 million. Municipal departmental budget requests, as the town administrator has not made his recommendation, we are still, you know, going through the budget requests. We are at 18.5 approximately, I'm sorry, 19.5, and we have 18.5 approximately available. And um, the school department's budget request, which they are discussing this evening as well, this is their modified level services budget request is 36 million and they have uh, 34,809 available. So you can see that we have a budget shortfall of uh, 2 million three. And that's all I have. And that's with for municipal level <coughs> services pretty much across the board. Um, I would say modified level services. Mm -hmm. We have about 585,000 of uh, new requests that bring it above. So, but we're still, you know, 500 in, in the whole room, so. Okay, questions, comments, Mr. O'Leary? Uh, not at this time, we have plenty of time to talk about it. I think so, yeah. I think I'm good for now, thank you. Mr. Walmer? Yeah, I was just gonna ask, is this the normal spot we'd be in around this time of year? Yeah. Yes. So this is normal. Okay. Until I pull the rabbit out of the hat. Mr. Studio, Mrs. Gonzalez, I have a quick question on that. The additional assessment for the capital for the Northeast, is it going to be 48000 annually, or does that increase or so that, that, that increase? That does increase. So for FY23, it's in the $49,000 you know, uh, range. FY24, same, same range. Then it goes up in, in uh, 25 and beyond to 271, mm -hmm. 271,000 approximately. <coughs> mm -hmm. So we have to plan, plan, yes. really plan for that. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Questions from the Finance Committee? All set? Okay, thank you. Great.
Yes. All right. We're going to call the meeting back to order. Folks. We have um, we have Mr. Hertz here on the Rail Trail press stage, but first we're going to hear from Mr. Walner, who's our liaison that's been working with the various committees in the in the. You town. are unmuted. There's a couple spots right here. Mr. Walner, I'll wait for him to come up. Just wait. Yeah, oh, take a walk. Absolutely. Right. So I can try to get a few folks in the corner. Yeah. Yeah. That would be great. Come over. I know. <laughs> you can put me where you want. Thank you. <laughs> You're sharing your screen as well? It looks like it says, it says share. Okay, great. All right, okay, thank you. Okay. Oh, I see. Go. We're all set to proceed, so we're going to welcome we're just gonna hear from mr walner all right so, okay. mr. so i just wanted to offer an introduction thank you for coming out tonight to hear about this this is the first time we've had a chance to uh, present the plan i wanted to give you a little historical perspective about how this could start in the first place um i happen to be working at the uh the apple i was doing a booth at the apple fest back in 2016 and a woman came up <coughs> to talk to me about a bike path down in in uh PB. And I had no idea what she was talking about. And she started asking, you know, do you know anything about the Linfield one? Do you know anything about the PB? And I said, no. And then she uh, quickly introduced me that there was this path that goes all the way up the North Shore and it'd be great if North Reading could find a way to do something like that. This goes right down my path. This was pre-select board. So I'm um, speaking right now as not a select board member, but as a citizen. Um, so I want to be clear that this is the first time the select board is, is here in this presentation as well. Um, so then I started working with a town planner. We started digging out maps. And then by April of 2017, Phil happened to hear I was thinking about this. He had an interest, so Phil became involved. He offers to give me a, a bike tour of the trail. Phil, uh, as you may know, is a very long lifetime resident of North Reading. is a project manager in his professional life and is also a consultant now as well. And what I saw when I went on the trails with Phil was just amazing that I had lived in this town since 91 and had no idea that running parallel to 62 is a whole series of trails that goes all the way down to Boston. And I never knew about it. And when I've asked people about town, if they knew about it, no one has known that as well. It exists right now. And here's the rub. We have no legal way to get into our own trails. There's no way to get there. You have to go through Linfield in order to be able to get there. And so that was the rub that we started to work on. So in May of 2017, Phil Hertz then joins the, the, the LUC, the Land Utilization Committee. Um, and from that point on, the rail trail has appeared on as a public agenda ever since that, that happened. In October of 2018, Phil and the LUC goes to town meeting to request $55,000 to conduct a feasibility study. This feasibility study brings together MassDOT, who is gonna be funding us, it brings together um, what is out there, so it means Phil has to dig through, uh, you know, easements, uh, plot plans, routes, all these other kind of things. And uh, so he gets a 50, we, the town approves it, hears about it, approves it. Phil, afterward, gets a grant for 45000 so it costs the town $10,000. Um, at that time, Transfer did a great job publicizing that. It was clearly a town meeting. In February of 2021, uh, Phil, the consultant, and I meet with the Mass DOT, but encounter some major problems. A lack of a terminus, of a suitable terminus in our own town, plus a lack of connectivity to other towns, threatens the feasibility of this project. Um, again, Linfield is standing directly in our path, and they said, absolutely no way this is going to happen. But although that was in February, by November, Linfield does a 180 degree entirely. Uh, they then uh, are bringing forward Willis Woods, which will be on their side of the trail as a new rec area in Linfield as a way to secure their water sources and keep it pure. And so then they bring in not only, they invite us not only to join in with them, but they bring in MAPC, which includes Middleton and Peabody. So now all four towns are being asked to support this effort to make this happen. Um, at that point, MassDOT gets excited again, and uh, we're off and going because we actually thought in February this project was almost over. 
Um, I will note that at that time, the transcript did a great job of advertising the Willis Woods public meeting, and the subsequent results included a significant section of the article devoted to Phil updating the readers to where the project was and the direction it was taken. I will also add that I have been reporting on these milestones during public sessions throughout my tenure on the board, and especially over the last few months. <clears throat> Meanwhile, LUC continues to post this project on their public agenda at almost every meeting. In February, just recently, the feasibility study is completed and shows promise to continue to, to advance this project. On March 17th, we then made a request to put the phase one funding on the June town warrant. Uh, LUC is sponsoring it. Phil and I then started preparing materials, which you're gonna to see tonight, and to get the info about the project out to town as soon as possible. Unfortunately, during the, our haste, someone posted an old map, which we thought had been removed from the town's website years ago. This caused much confusion. Also, if you looked at the feasibility report, there were three different route options to consider, which also caused confusion. So meanwhile, again, Phil and I have prepared slides for you, which should help clear up confusion and set the record straight tonight so we can all deliberate based on real data. I am asking that even if you thought you knew what this project was about before, based on social media, that you pay close attention before you cast judgment. From my view, and I think Phil, Phil feels the same way, the trail could be a hidden gem that will benefit our community for generations to come. It also comes at a time when Mass DOT is quite excited about us moving forward and funding it. You should also recognize, however, that many rules come with this funding, most notably, protecting the wetlands and wildlife amongst many other concerns. We cannot just pave a path. That is why the project costs so much to build, which Mass DOT is intending to pay for. I will also point out that this project helps to meet our recreational goals as spelled out in the Open Space and Recreation Plan of 2020. For example, the number one goal that was concluded from that study was that um, provide a connected system of safe walking and biking trails and routes and then cooperate and coordinate with regional and state recreational planning efforts. That was goal number one out of 10 goals. Um, and the priority items that were brought out of that study, uh, uh, again, number one, continue evaluating a feasibility of creating a new multi-use path through town, identify rights of ways and public easements that can be linked to the existing trail system, Promote and establish safe bike routes, including protected bike lanes where feasible and shared roadway signs on town roads. And then finally, uh, another high priority was evaluate and pursue, if appropriate, improved access from high school and town common area to Ipswich River Park through walking, biking, transit, school bus, and other means. This is what we're hoping, this is what we're trying to satisfy. So that all being said, change is hard. We intend to have more open sessions beyond tonight to gather feedback. We also hope that you can think beyond what may happen in your own backyard and think about the benefit to the community. My backyard is Martin's Pond, which I share with many people, and we are delighted that people enjoy it so much. We hope you feel the same and support the same proposal we are making here at the town meeting in June. But of course, you have a vote. So please learn more, ask questions, we want to hear your feedback. We've already made some changes from the feedback we've heard so far. Uh, by June vote, though, we're asking for your support. Thank you, and I'll hand it over to Phil. Um, actually, <clears throat> I just want, for the members of the public, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give some qualifications to the comments that you just heard. The, the, this matter of the recreational trail has actually been in the works and kind of vision, vision planning for a long time, since so before I came on the board in 2015. It's not a new idea, and it's been in public discussion. Many people don't realize that, as, a, as members of public bodies, we're not allowed to post to social media, respond to you on social media, respond or talk to one another in, a, in more than a forum outside of these forums. Anything that we're supposed to do, we're supposed to do here in these forums so that you know and you see and you hear what's going on. So unfortunately, when some misinformation gets posted, we're not allowed to just reach out and say, hey, that's wrong, and here's my opinion on it, because of the fact that that's basically <coughs> giving an opinion on something that's going to come before us, and it's likely to reach a forum, and that would be a violation of the law. So it's important to realize we don't mean to be radio silent when things are posted there. We're bound by the requirements of the open meeting law, and you have to hear it here. 
and, and we're trying the best that we can to make all of these meetings as accessible. But since I started, one of the first things I recall was Mr. Hertz's presentation about the possibility of this recreational trail. And that goes back to 2015, before your time. Now, Mr. Waller is saying his comments are here as, a, as an individual or as a member of the public, but he in fact serves as our liaison on the LUC. So all the board members also have different positions for all the different boards and commissions and with a tie-in back and forth. So something that happens at the LUC, Mr. Wallenworth will update us during board member inputs at the end of our meetings. And the final thing I'm going to add is because it's been in sort of planning and you know uh, design and discussion for all these years, it's been on the strategic plan that the board reviews annually. With the exception of COVID, we get together <coughs> annually and we work on our assessment of how we're doing to meet our goals, our objectives, that's posted online. The board does set us some, some foresight and some planning, some future future casting basically for the town, the town's needs and where the town's gonna move forward. So the recreational trail has actually been on a strategic plan as well for several years and it comes up in our discussions annually on the strategic plan. And this past uh, last Monday when we met on our strategic plan, it came up that we learned that there was a, a another older proposed route that was posted on Facebook. And I'm sure everybody here as we sit here realizes not everything that you read on Facebook is, is accurate, but somehow it was on, it was something that just didn't get changed. It's another reason why we need an IT department so that we can update the things as the, as the information comes through it should be updated for you. And so that's why we felt the need as a result of that discussion to, to bring it back here. And we haven't taken any votes on it. We have, we have, we're seeing this with you for the first time t this evening. But I know that Mr. Walner has been going to the different boards and committees <coughs> in their public process to explain this to them as well, a community planning commission. So we're, we're seeing it with you, most of us are seeing it with you for the first time here. So we don't have the answers to questions yet until we see it. And we probably have many more questions than you might have too. So so I just wanted to qualify thank those you. remarks. Yep. Appreciate Mr. That. Hertz, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, so <clears throat> some some photographs of what, what we currently have, um, just, just to set the stage. And the, the, the upper left is the Peabody Independence Greenway. Um, that trail connects to the Greater Boston Network of Trails. Um, I'll get into that. But that paved stretch of road that heads, heads into West Peabody from the Middleton, Linfield, North Reading Town line, um, that's, that's what the proposed trail would look like. Um, it would be uh, a paved trail except where the wetlands or over bridges where it would be PVC. Um, but it, 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 it's not a rough trail, it's, 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 a, it's a finished looking 12-foot um, wide trail. The, the other photos on the page are what currently exists within North Reading and, and in Linfield, mostly in North Reading, these pictures. Um, the abandoned rail bed um, uh, in, in the woods that are sort of just south of uh, Elm Street, Route 62, um, the, Ipswich, the Ipswich River, um, in what we're now calling Riverwood. The, the, the parcel of land that was uh, purchased by the town 10 or 15 years ago from the Smith family is now known as, as Riverwoods. So now I'll call, I'll call it Riverwoods in this, in this presentation, but that's, that's, what, that's what we're talking about. Um, it, it has access right to the Ipswich River, beautiful scenes. Um, Willis Woods, uh, you heard some mention from, from Rich. Um, Willis Woods is an area in Linfield that has been closed to the public for many years. It's, it, it's their water district land. Uh, it, it, it adjoins uh, North Reading. Um, beautiful views of the Ipswich. Um, these, these trails are all in North Reading. They exist today. Um, they're primarily used illegally by ATVers. Um, and and uh, the ATVers are, are trespassing on, North, on, on private property and, and they are um, digging up the trails. Um, <coughs> just just a few other just a few other quick pictures. 
Um, uh, the picture in the upper left is, is where the entrance to Riverwoods would be off of the <coughs> street. That would be a parking area. Um, the, uh, the, the pictures um, in, 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 the, in the lower left, um, both, that's the rail bed uh, in, as it exists in, Red, in North Reading, would be both east and west. Um, the pictures in the middle are the rail bed that is uh, between Park Street and uh, Railroad Avenue. Um, and the, um, the area in the upper right is a, is a defunct rail bridge that is just beyond it, which River Park, beyond Chestnut Street. Um, and uh, the lower picture is in it's which River Park. Um, it, it's a part of it's which River Park. It's, just, it's still a, a dirt trail. It's never been paved. So, Rich, Rich, Rich went over sort of the timeline pretty quickly. Um, the feasibility study was funded in 2018 by town meeting. Uh, we also received the 2020 Mass Trails grant, um, explored route options, planning and construction cost estimates, easement challenges, and, and the next step, of, the next step which, is, which is where we're facing right now, which is um, the initial design phase, 25% design. Um, just, just to be clear, there are, there are two design stages. Uh, this is the first design stage, the initial design. Um, then, uh, then there is subsequently a final design. Uh, both entail about the same amount of effort. Um, the uh, project initiation form, the PIF form, has been sent to and received by MassDOT. Um, it, um, uh, it, they, they, the initial, you know, it, it passed the, the, the form passed muster, it goes through a project review committee, and then makes its way to the Metropolitan Planning Organization for their approval, and, and once they approve it, it's put on the STIP, the, the State Transportation Improvement Plan. That does not mean it is a done deal. It just means that it's been assigned a project number, that there's a tentative date for construction in the future, probably five, eight years out, um, and that construction, the, the money that would go towards the construction and the actual commitment to construction is contingent on the 25% phase of construction, the 75% or the final phase of construction, um, it's, it's contingent on having a clear easements and clear rights of proper, rights of title to all of the, the rights of way of the trail, um, that all permitting um, has, has been done. So basically, uh, even though there's a placeholder with mascot, um, it, it's a whole slew of things that have to be done um, before we uh, before we they say okay we're ready to pay ten million dollars or more for this project um, and then and then lastly um, the MAPC study a vision for Willis Woods which again is the area is some six hundred and fifty acres in in, in Linfield um, that uh, Linfield wants to open up to the public um, it's on the rail bed. Uh, it, it, adjoins, it adjoins the rail bed that, that's part of North Reading. Um, our trail would feed into their trail network and would give North Reading residents direct access to that 600 acres plus the acreage that is known as that we're calling Riverwoods. Why, why does the trail make sense uh, for, for North Reading, particularly at this time? So <coughs> the, the request for funding um, for town meeting in June is for $850,000 for that initial design phase. There would be a similar cost for, um, for the 75% uh, design phase plus a sort of a contingent an allowance for contingencies. So roughly a two million, potentially a $2 million expenditure for the town. In exchange, the, the um, MassDOT would contribute nine and a half to ten million dollars. And I'll say when I had a conversation with MassDOT last week, they're they're saying that they think that that's actually low, and that certainly by the time it's constructed, it would be uh, be, a, be be more than the nine or ten million dollars we're proposing here. None of which really presented an, an issue to them. Um, they were very enthusiastic about this project. The the funding. Though it's administered by MassDOT, the funding is primarily federal money. 
It's coming from the federal gas tax, and more recently, it's coming from the infrastructure bill that just passed by Congress. So uh, while there is normally a, a good amount of money coming into MassDOT from just the gas tax portion of, of, of the federal money, there's an exceptional amount of money right now. So uh, the chances of getting this done and the chances of tapping into this federal money, which is already earmarked for <coughs> trails, it's not like if we don't use it, it's gonna go, it's gonna be building something else. This, this money is earmarked for recreational trails. Um, you know, we have access to this money now that might not be available again in the future. Um, the, um, there are two bridges that would be built um, as part of this project. Um, one bridge would be built from Elm Street um, uh, ac across the wetlands. It actually would be well above the, the river, well above the marshes. Um, it would start at the street level and it would extend probably about 300 yards um, south in, into, into river woods. Um, and uh, this will give the town access to that land that it acquired some 15 years ago. Um, it has not had access. When the, when the town acquired that land, um, it initially had an easement on two bridges um, that were privately owned by the Smith family. Uh, but in the, in the process of negotiations and, and courts discussions, those easements were, were given back to the family. And, and the town uh, essentially has no direct access um, to those lands now. And they're, as I said, you can see in the picture, those are, those are beautiful lands, um, trails, birds, <coughs> wildlife. Um, every reason that it was a good decision to buy those lands, um, they're, they're just waiting for a means of get, getting people in there. And so, as part of this project, we would build a bridge from, from 62 Elm Street over the, on, on columns, <coughs> over the river, over the wetlands, onto dry land in, 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 in Riverwoods. That bridge by itself is probably over $2 million. The, the second bridge um, would be connecting the high school, um, middle school, uh, the fields, uh, the, the football field, the track area, um, uh, to Ipswich River Park directly. Um, again, it's, uh, it, would, it would, of course, be at the same level as Route 62, and it would be on pillars that would take it above the marsh and above the river down onto dry land that's in Ipswich River Park. Um, it's important to note that both, uh, both of these bridges would be built entirely on town-owned land. Um, the, uh, there is a, there's a parcel the, the, the parcel on Route 62 going into Riverwoods, um, there, there is a strip of land um, that's adjacent to the bridges that the Smiths own, um, but it's town owned and it, it abuts uh, Route 62 with frontage, with clear frontage on Route 62. Um, the parking as well that would be built um, on Route 62, that, that's all town owned land. And the land uh, for the bridge from uh, Park Street Route 62 into Ipswich River Park. That again, it, it's all town-owned land. It, it's a town-owned parcel that, that goes onto uh, onto Route 62 across. Um, so that the, the kids could cross directly, or they could walk 100 feet up to the light that's already existing and, and walk back. Um, but it would it would it would eliminate um, the walking either way up Havel Street or uh, driving driving down Central Street to get to Ipswich River Park. Um, the, um, we're looking, the total, uh, the total uh, mileage for the trail is some two and a half miles. It might be a little bit longer because we've, in the last week or so, we've adapted the trail um, to go around some properties, um, which will add a little bit of distance. But it's somewhere in the two and a half mile range. Um, and uh, from, from our trail in North Reading, we would have access to un currently unimproved trails in Willis Woods and in, in Linfield. You saw pictures of them. While they're unimproved, they're, they're pretty clearly trails, and it, and it wouldn't take much for Linfield to improve them. Um, at the moment, I don't think Linfield's interested in doing it to the extent that we are working with MassDOT and building a, a paved, handicapped, accessible trail network, um, but they may be at some point. It's certainly, the trails are certainly there, and, they cer and people would certainly have access to walking through the woods. So. Here's a, here's a picture of, of, of sort of the big area um, 
you know, from the Independence Greenway. So I showed you a picture in those first sets of slides of the Independence Greenway. That was that paved, that paved trail going off into the distance. So that, that's West Peabody here. And that, that Independence Greenway goes um, uh, all the way to um, what, was, what I used to call the Sims Plaza. It's not Sims anymore. Um, but, um, uh, and it, it eventually makes its way to Route 1. They're in the process of building a bridge over Route 1, a bicycle bridge, a, a, a recreational trail bridge over Route 1, um, right where the rail crossing, uh, near where the rail crossing currently is. And um, that, that Independence Greenway continues on all the way to, uh, to Salem. There's also um, trail networks that go up to Linfield. You can see here that the rail bed, um, as it exists in, uh, in Linfield um, and here in, here in North Reading, and over here on the far left is Ipswich Park with clear gaps in between. Now, the, this is what the greater, the greater um, border to Boston Trail Network um, looks like. Um, North Reading, uh, on the map on the right here, North Reading is up here. You can see the, the, the Independence Greenway comes off and connects to, the, to, connects to this entire greater uh, Boston Trail Network. There's the trail that goes up towards uh, Topsfield, and then it makes its way up to Newburyport and all, all the way to the Seabrook Line. Um, and there are trails that connect down um, to Everett and Chelsea and, and down into Boston. Um, so uh, this, when, when completed, we would have, we would have connectivity to, to all of this. The Willis Woods Project, which, which was undertaken um, sort of the second half of last year, um, Linfield uh, realized that they had this great 600 and some odd acres of land that was not being open to the public and, and really needed to be. There was a change of leadership in the water district. The water district had been fighting it, and the water district is no longer fighting it. Linfield also purchased some land um, over here um, that's, that, that uh, has access to a road, has, gives them some access from, from their, their roadways in, into this land. Um, but by far, we would have, if, if we build this, this bridge from, uh, into Riverwoods, uh, we would have um, the, the simplest access into, into all of this land. Uh, you can see the, the green is what they're calling Willis Woods. Um, and uh, there are trails that go around Bostick, which is, which is this little blip here. Um, so that you can get around Boston either to the north or to the south. All right, so, so this is the, okay, so this, this is the trail as we're currently proposing it. And this is slightly different from what, um, it's certainly different from what people were seeing in those maps from a year and a half, two years ago, which were very preliminary. Um, Mr. Hurd, is there any way that you can just kind of make that, it's very hard to see. Can we turn on the lights? Yeah. Or should we turn on the lights? Yeah. You can turn, turn all the lights on. <laughs> That's my department, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, if you, if you are able to, you know, basically from beginning you know, from either left to right or right to left. Yeah, he's going to start at the top and work his way down. That's a good, that's great. Yeah, that no, I, I'll, I'll you know, As you're going through it, it would be, I'm sure you're going to do this, but identifying who owns what. Yeah, and then it's absolutely. It's yeah. Absolutely, no problem. All right, so let, let's start Let's start from the beginning. I always think that it's easiest to start from Linfield because that's, that's the connectivity point into the greater trail network. So the trail would effectively start here on, on Route 62 uh, uh, in Elm Street, um, there would be there would be parking here uh, on on the south side of Route 62. Um, unclear how many cars. Uh, I would guess at least 10, may, maybe more cars. Room, room for substantial cars, so that people would not be parking on the street. Um, but they'll, they'll just just let's orient people. It's like opposite Pleasant Street. Yes. Right. Yeah. Oh. No, 
So the, the bridge, the bridge, the bridge extends probably three, two or three hundred yards, um, and the parking lot, actually, the parking lot also, both the bridge and the parking lot would be built on columns, um, uh, uh, concrete or steel columns that would keep it well above the the wetlands. Um, the straight line is not necessarily a straight line. This is, again, this is all river woods in here. The line would, the the, the actual path would be. Um, drawn in the, in, the, in, the, in the coming up 25% design phase to avoid wetlands. Uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't go through these wetlands. It would obviously go around the wetlands. And the path would make its way to the Linfield North Reading line, which is right there. Then um, it would, it's going to follow the rail bed um, within North Reading along this line. This line is all, the straight line is the rail bed. Now that, that first piece of property that abuts North Reading uh, is town-owned property, that little triangular piece that, that belongs to the, to the town. The, the next stretch, which is green, and I, the color codes here, green means town-owned. Um, uh, yellow means it's town-owned, but it, it, it's, on, it's on a street, and red means it's privately owned. So the, 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 green, the green stretch here actually belongs to the town of Danvers. Um, I, I still consider it a town owned. My understanding is that I've been to a previous select board meeting some years ago where it had been brought up that Danvers had actually approached North Reading about um, giving us this land. Um, but we, 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 we will need to at least get access through it from, from Danvers. The, 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 next, the next property belongs to uh, a Patricia Lambert. This is, this is um, an unbuildable lot. The only dry area in this land is the rail bed itself. Um, uh, it is a critical component to the, to the trail. It's, the assessed value of that land is only $19,000. Uh, Ms. Lambert has not paid taxes on that land since 2010, and um, there was a lien placed against the, the land in 2012 and it is, it's my understanding um, that uh, it, the process is moving forward in tax court um, for, uh, to acquire that land. Uh, that may or may not happen, um, but we, will, we, we would need to um, acquire the easement or acquire the land. Now, what's interesting is um, that land um, has uh, an easement, a 30-foot easement to I think it's nine Apple Tree Lane, and um, the what, what I what we have been showing for um, the most direct path of the trail is through the Lambert property onto the Delisle property, um, and then straight straight to Park Street. Um, while that's still showing as one of the options, at the moment it's not the preferred option. The preferred option would be to acquire the Lambert property along with the easement to, to Apple Tree Lane. Apple Tree Lane has a sidewalk. I have some photos of it in the back. Apple Tree Lane has a sidewalk. The sidewalk would probably have to be improved. Uh, out, to, out to Park Street and then along to Park Street um, up to where the rail bed uh, historically crossed Park Street. Um, so the the, well, the trail, the trail would, would actually follow, would be on um, sidewalks that would need to be extended on Park Street. The current, the current sidewalks on Park Street basically stop at Sylvia Road, um, so sidewalks or trail would need to be extended south, um, southeast on Park Street to connect to the sidewalks that are coming from Apple Tree Lane. Um, at, at, the, at where the rail, where the rail a road uh, used to cross um, Park Street. It there really is no option um, but to go across the, the to work with the Delisles and to cross the Delisle property um, into areas into the area behind the, De, the, the Delisle yard, um, which um, is is heavily wooded. I had I had pictures of the uh, uh, of the rail bed. Uh, in that general area, not of the Delisle property per se, but of sort of the, 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 uh, the rail bed um, that's on town loan land 
the, the next parcel after Delisle is, is, is a town owned parcel, which you can see here. The, the Delisles own that fair stretch of, of what is effectively rail bed, overgrown rail bed um, in, in the back of their property. The next stretch here, the green stretch, is, um, is town owned. Um, there's a little piece of privately owned land that's sort of at the end of Railroad Avenue. Um, these people had come to the LUC some years ago when we were starting on this project, when they heard about it. Um, they're actually amenable to an easement. They, they want to do some sort of land swap. They, 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 they want to get enough, they, they, have, they have an interest in um, doing something so they can make a buildable lot here. And it, we need to sort of explore that, but I think, I think that's a feasible route here. The trail would then actually run along Railroad Avenue. There's a sidewalk on Railroad Avenue, but Railroad Avenue is a, a quiet enough street that um, it, it, could, it could conceivably just run along, along Railroad Avenue. Out, out to Haverhill Street. Um, now, once once we cross Haverhill Street, um, let me, let me, so let, let me just go back. So here's a close up of, of what we're proposing to go around the Burkmeyer property. Um, there's there's Apple Tree Lane, Park Street and then up to the Delisle property. And here's, and here's the sort of, here's the close up of what it would look like near Haverhill Street. The, the actual rail bed followed Railroad Avenue um, right across where I think it's Bay State Auto Body, there's an auto body um, repair tow, towing area. Um, it actually went through where those buildings are, through, through the parking area in the rear and into what is now a Fish River Park. Um, it's, it's not feasible to, I mean, even if, even if um, the owners wanted to give us a, an easement, which is certainly would be, maybe would be difficult for their business, it just doesn't make sense because it, it would, this is an apartment building, it would pass too, way too close to the apartment building, uh, excuse me, this is the apartment building here. Um, would, pass, would pass right in front of the apartment building. So it doesn't make sense to, to, to go through this property at all. It makes sense to go around it in the wetland. This is, this is very wet in here, so this would all be built on, on boardwalk. Um, this board, when I say boardwalk, it, it's really more of a bridge. These would be, they'd be built on pilings, well, out, well, above, the, well above the marsh. The pilings would be um, quite well spaced. There, there are strict rules on, on how you build a, a, a bar and walk such as this in a wetland. Um, and part of the part of the 25% design phase is, is people would go in there, they do, they do they're gonna do soil samples, they're gonna find out how, how deep they have to go to, to put the pilings, how far apart the pilings to be, and, and, and do a deep dive on any impact that there would be to the wetlands. That's all part of the upcoming phase. And, th and then once we get around, um, you know, sort of around the, the, the base, the, the auto body stop here, um, running again on the outside of their property. It's still their property. This is their property in here, but it's all wet. It's not usable, um, and we would be proposing to run it on the outside of their fence in, 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 in land that they, they own, but really is not usable for their business. Um, and then we would come around into Hipsitch River Park, which is high and dry. And then here's the bridge from um, Park Street, the, the, the middle school, high school fields are right over here. Th this is a town owned parcel here. It, it's, it's, it's dry, there's, there's a stretch of maybe 50 feet that's dry when you, um, when you uh, come off of Park Street um, and then, and then it, it drops off and becomes wet going across the river and then there's sort of a spit of dry land on the other side. Um. <clears throat> So that, that takes us into Ipswich River Park. This, this little stretch here in Ipswich River Park is what I showed you a picture of in the beginning. It, it, it's unpaved, it's unfinished. People walk their dogs on there. Um, uh, we, this would be paved as part of the project. And then uh, there's, no, there's a gap in here because there's plenty of existing trails within Ipswich River Park. Um, we don't need to build new trails in that stretch. And then on the, on the, on the west side, um, this is all town-owned land. 
uh, basically from where we enter Ipswich River Park all the way to the end to, on the western terminus. This is all town-owned land. Um, we, the rail bed is um, high and dry throughout this, <coughs> this whole stretch here. Uh, there is, a, a, I showed you a picture in the beginning, um, that bridge with the pilings um, is right here. Um, that would need to be rebuilt. That's not nearly as an expensive a bridge as these, uh, but I've been warned not to, not to make, not to consider it trivial either. All right. So, um, in terms of costs and challenges, um, twenty-five percent design, eight hundred fifty thousand, maybe another eight hundred fifty thousand for the seventy-five percent, and then. Um, there are there are several easements that need to be negotiated. Now, you, you, it's fair to ask the question: Why are we moving forward with asking for money now when we don't have all the easements? I mean, it's a logical question to ask. And when uh, Rich and I were working on this thing uh, about a year and a half ago, um, when we got that grant from Mass. Uh, Mass Trails, the purpose, the initial purpose of that grant was to work with the homeowners and to begin negotiations with the easements and figure out, you know, what it would take to um, acquire easements in these properties. And uh, the, the funding, the money was going to be used to, to pay town council for helping with the negotiations. But when we began discussions with town council, the first thing that they told us was that we were out of phase that both MassDOT and State of Massachusetts regulations um, require, absolutely require, that the 25% initial design be completed before there are any serious easement discussions. It's okay to talk to homeowners and say, we're doing this, how do you feel about it, you know, you know are you really against it, and, and, and work with them at a high level. But in terms of saying, okay, well, what would, you know, how much, you know, is there, is there, is there an amount, would you consider granting an easement? Those specific discussions can't take place until we make that $850,000 investment. Um, all right. Now, um, the, the feasibility study, we commissioned, the, the, the $55,000 was a commission to, to commission a, a consulting firm, BSC, to look at building a rail trail or a recreational trail all the way from Linfield to Wilmington. Um, and, and, and we did that as part of the trail. We actually looked at lands um, not only ending at Chestnut Street, which is, the, which is the plan that I've shown you here, but we looked at taking, it, taking a phase all the way to Route 28 and eventually even possibly taking it um, to Lin Wilmington and through to Lin and through a piece of Wilmington to Route 62 in Wilmington. Um, the, the phase that goes from 28 to Route 62 in Wilmington is very complicated. That land is, is owned by the post office and New England Electric. Um, also, it doesn't really abut a lot of residential area. Um, so given the complexity of, 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 of the land, we, we sort, of, sort of put that aside. Um, but we did look more seriously at um, a trail, at, at it, what if we took the trail to Route 28? Um, and it, it's, for the most part, there is rail bed. For at least 50% of it, there is rail bed. Um, and the trail would, would come out on 28, just south of the old stop and shop um, gas station area. Um, it would run along 28, and, and, and you'd have a parking lot sort of right there by the gas station. Um, there are there are easement challenges with this with this stretch of road a stretch of trail um, it uh, it crosses a piece of property where it would actually bifurcate um, a piece of property here um, it's possible to take it around the piece of property but this is effectively Martin's Brook so it's 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 super marshy regardless the the what we're this phase that we're doing now, phase one, does not take it beyond Chestnut Street. So while we can look at this and it's, it'd be nice someday maybe to get it to Route 28, we are not proposing to take it to 28 at this time. Okay, so um, 
just just a, 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 I'm almost done. So um, just a few other photos. So the Delisle property, which is uh, which is where we would bring the the, the trail up Park Street, um, and it would cross. This is the Delisle property. Um, the rail bed extends in the in the woods behind their property. Um, this that is the Burkmeyer property, which we're not planning to. The, the proposed route at the, at the moment does not propose impacting um, the, the Griffin properties or the Berkmeyer <coughs> properties at all. Um, this nine apple tree lane is where the uh, the easement that I mentioned that's on the Lambert property, it would come out here, sort of that's a basketball, the basketball court, it would come out here to the right of this basketball court, that's a 30 foot easement. Um, um, and um, this, is, this is a picture of the sidewalk on Apple Tree Lane. And this is, these two pictures are Park Street where uh, a sidewalk would need to be built to bring it up to, um, to the crossing here at the Delilah Park. And that's it. Do you have photos showing what I told right to the two people's yards right there from the pool that pools? Up, 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 up here. Up here. Folks, 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 and I believe you, on the proposed route you showed us, you depicted three. Right, there's the Lambert property, which is in, which is in the middle of the woods. To the right there. To right. the right. That was it, the picture you just showed us. No, no, no the, the, the Lambert property. The Lambert property? No. Yeah. Those Delisles. The Delisles. Uh, so the Lambert property is in tax court. For non payment of taxes. Okay. And that's the first bit one we ran into. This is what the Lambert property looks like. Okay. It, it, it's, it's basically these those, those rail, abandoned rail beds in the middle of the woods. Okay, and then the Delisle property is what I just showed you. So that entire stretch, which is depicted in red, is all the Delisle parcel? Yes, yes, it's one property. How and much of that is woods? And as home is three, three, I'd say probably 75 or 80 percent of it. It's woods. Woods, 70 percent of it. I mean, if you go back to the... We're, we're definitely going to, I'm going to come to the board members for questions. If we go to the... Just, so, he's just so, trying to answer the resident's question about where and that, that that stretch there, which I don't know, maybe maybe it's two hundred feet. I don't, I don't know. I didn't. The percentages could be off, but maybe that's maybe that's two hundred feet from from Park Street to where the woods start. But then it's 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 there's another four hundred feet or so in the woods. Are we allowed to ask questions? So that we're, we're, we're gonna, well, I think he's not done yet. Oh. So, <laughs> I, 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 Lambert, Delisle. Yes. The other private parcels that this is running through. It runs through um, this area that's owned by, I think the, the Hind family owns this, this piece of property. That's number one. Is the one right? Where your cursor is, that's number two. Who owns that? Uh, well, number zero, this little piece here, the zero property is, is, is the town. The 100, this 114 Haverhill Street, I think that's owned by the Hine family. Um, and then and then this, this lot here and this lot here are owned by a realty company, which I believe is associated with the, with the, uh, um, with, with the auto body shop. So you've one, got 112, 112 Haverhill Realty LLC. Three of those four are part private parcels. 
Right. Uh, yeah. Other than that little that little nick there. So yeah, yeah th these are private. Okay. And that so there's <coughs> landlords that are Delisle. Hines and a realty company. Yeah, the 112, 112 Havel Street LLC. It is a small tad at Railroad Ave. Uh, and a small, yes, and, and there's a, I'd have to go look who owns that. Also, Nicosia on Nicosia Railroad Ave would be going right through her property. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, people that weren't mentioned in there. Yeah. The Chatham yeah. properties. Yeah. Did I say something? Yes, we're gonna we're gonna let people speak one at a time. Come to the podium, state your name and your address, okay? And Rita's already up there. It's just so. part of, I'm sorry, it's part yeah. of it. Phil, Phil, has I mean, to say what you want. No, it's, it's part of no, it's just part of the own. Seat. I know that. It's, it's I know part of the presentation. This is this is this is knowledge. Please add to the dialogue, please. Yeah, but the point is what Phil is showing you tonight is. Like it's showing you that this is what has been proposed. The, uh, some of the maps that have been on, you know, looking on the internet and everything else show different maps. And I think it's very, very clear, which uh, H. said it, there was a mistake of maps that were supposed to have been cleared a year and a half ago, and they weren't. So a lot of the maps that show absolutely it's going through somebody's swimming pool in the middle of somebody's property. I've received one call, uh, you know, from that and said LUC has had no intentions of taking anybody's property, no matter what map they saw. The maps that you're seeing tonight is what we are going through, and if it, somebody sees that it's going through, through their property, LUC has not contacted every person that may have shown up on it. What you see now is the ones that he's talking about, and like I said, you cannot make offers to say we're going to buy it or not. But in the 26 years that LUC has been around, we have never taken anybody's property. And we built Ipswich River Park, and we transferred the school property. And everything we've done, we have never approached and taken anybody's property. If there are areas that at the end we can go through and offer to buy a piece of property to make this work, we will do that. But anything that anybody has seen, other than what you're looking at tonight, if it's going through your property, I think those are the people that should be speaking. Anybody else has a right to certainly speak about it, but if you don't see it going through the property, it is not what LUC has been uh, talking about in all our meetings. So if there are areas that you see some the property is there and we haven't mentioned it, those are the ones we'd like to hear from first so Phil can explain. Yes. And, and from the chair, we're going to recognize people, including whoever wants to speak on this. I need to go to my colleagues to see if they have any questions while Mr. Hertz is presenting. And then if you, you're finished, if you can just stay here, because you might have questions that you'd be able to answer, if you don't mind. I know that's unusual for public comment, but you're here. So um, Mr. O'Leary, any questions? Not at this time. I'd, I'd like to hear the concerns of some of the people. I mean, this is the first that I've seen the entire map presented at all. I mean, it was in our packet this week, so I happened to look at it. Um, but this is the first time that I have seen the proposed route ever. You know, uh, as far as I mean, we, we've had discussions. Phil has been before the board several times. There's been discussions ongoing for a number of years in relation to uh, the value of a. Of a uh, Passive recreation walkway, you know, through town on the old railroad bed. Uh, so this is not new discussion, uh, but this is a definitive proposed plan, you know, to consider for execution here. Um, but this is the first I've seen it. Um, so we're talking about Lambert, Delisle, small piece of a railroad ave, um, little Hines. piece by the Heinz property, and and then 112 Havel Street. And it is, and it's Railroad Ave is Nicosia? No, Railroad Ave is, is another yeah, private exactly. ownership that took deed to the property probably six, eight years ago. Yeah, yeah. They, they uh, it, used to be, it used to be the Edmonds property, I believe. Yeah, <coughs> at the end. yeah right okay. at the very end. So there's right off the bat, I think there's a little confusion on that. And do you have any questions? No, and then you're looking to terminate it right now. The proposal is at Chestnut Street. You're Chestnut. not looking to go beyond no, not that at Street. all. And that's included in the proposal to mass dot for the 9.9, 9.5 <coughs> plus million. Yes. Okay. 
Right. Uh, that's all for now. Thank you. Yeah, well, I'm going to come back to the members yeah. too after the public has a chance. Just want questions? I'll just um, okay. the, the comment is the uh, $850,000 that we're asking for the town in June. Um, are you already applied for a grant? Can you just explain what's going on with that? Yes, I, I applied for a grant that could be as much as $300,000. There's no guarantee or that we get it. Uh, it could be, and if we get it, it would not necessarily be the 300. It could certainly be something less. <coughs> it would be a mass trail grant, and it could be used to. Uh, defray the cost of the $850,000. And the, the unfortunate part is we're not going to hear about that till maybe July. July. I'll when I heard about the fifty-five, it was August. So. Okay. okay. Thank you. That's it. Mr. Studo. So one thing I want to clarify, it was also said on Facebook, the select board has not voted for this warrant article would be a town meeting yet. So it's I, LUC sponsored. I, the select board has not voted yet. That's true. So I have a problem with Facebook insinuating that this board voted for that. And I have a real problem because it's coming from people who should know better. So I'm gonna say that. And now it's been said twice. So I'm not saying I'm for or against it, but I'm definitely against anybody putting words in my mouth. So, but I do have a question. Just to, and then I'll have more commentary after. So, we need to spend though, let's say it gets there to town meeting. I'm not gonna be able to know if the property owners who we may have to buy town, you know, pay off, mm -hmm. for lack of a better way to put it. We have to spend 850,000 without a guarantee. So pretty much I have to go to town meeting and ask for 850,000 to then have coffee with them at Heavenly Donuts to say, hey, now that we spent 850, the state, now that we're in phase two, they're gonna let me ask you. That, that's, See, that's a tough pill to swallow. I, 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 I get it. And, and uh, if, if we were building a, a new town road that was paid for by state money, you'd have exactly the same issue. Um, it's, it's the way the state of Massachusetts works. I'm aware of that because I'm with Mr. O'Leary working on sewer and that's gonna be a big ask. But, you know, I'm not asking anybody to, you know, give up their garden to put sewer on 28. So again, I want to hear what everybody says. I'm not talking to the merits. I prefer a bike trail. That's where I like to go. You know, because when I cycle on Haverhill Street, it's like, you know, life is in danger the entire time. But at the same time, it just, again, I feel a lot more comfortable if I could speak to, you know, the, the property owners, but it seems that we first have to spend 850000 and I'm just saying there is a whole list of things right now that we have to ask for money for, and at least I can explain those a little bit. So I'm just giving you my initial thoughts, like that this is the one thing I didn't know about that, you know, the state would love us to put 850000 and maybe we'll get 300000 back, and maybe we'll hear about it in July, you know. Yeah, I'm not counting on the three hundred. So let's just call it the 850. Right. So that's my thing where, you know, I've already heard informally that some of these people, I don't care if we spend three million to satisfy the state, they're not selling to us. Huh? So, and that brings up a whole other issue that after I hear what some others, I'll give my opinion on. Thank you. This is good silence. First, I'd just like to say that I am thrilled to see everybody here. It makes me happy because you know, when we decided to put this on the agenda to discuss it, it's communication. It, it lets you all know the facts, what's really happening, instead of just the gossip. So, you know, we have agendas at every meeting and talk about all kinds of things and then all kinds of other stuff gets talked about outside of this. So, um, the more you attend and the more you hear and the more you know, the better it is. Um, I have a question about the Delal property. That picture didn't show the house. How close is that back to the house? 50 feet. 50 feet? Let's, let's, cutting the three let's, and a half acre lot. Let's not, Mr. Hurt. Sir, I'm sorry. We have to go through the yeah. chair at these yeah. meetings. And 
Mr. Hertz is here to present, and then we're going to hear from you. I promise. Oh, no, no, you. I understand. But Mr. Hertz, do you I, have? I, a, you know, I, Can you yes, close no. up on that too? Because if, if, is, it, is it all possible for you to kind of zone in Can on that? Can somebody hit this? one of the lights? Just film one. <coughs> uh, the, other one. the other one. <laughs> the other one. And then the property line, the Delisle property line, is right here. The trail would would run very close to his property line. It's actually closer to the abutter's house, which is on the other side of this telephone pole, um, than the Delisle house. This is this pool. This fence here is their pool area. The, the house is the house is to the left. It's not in the picture. So I, I can't. I don't know if it's, if you if you show the if you show, show the, the route map, on if you show the map with Park and uh, yeah. Mount Vernon. Come together the map itself. You, you can, can see the structures on it. Yeah, it is. Right. Yeah. There so there, there's there's there, there's there's the house. There's there's two. There's there's that, that's I think that's a business a garage and a business. Yep. That's a barn. Yeah. Barn. Barn. And and that's that's the house. You can see it's it's actually closer to the abutter's house. Yeah. Okay. It's in the back of the. That's barn. not the picture you show. The picture I showed, I was standing about where that, I was standing on Park Street. You were Street. way to the left, right sir, next to sir, my driveway. Sir, <laughs> sir, please, please. It's really important. We all need to get information, not get into arguments about it. It's just going to help us if we get I understand, I understand. And then you can tell us what that's a picture of, because I'm curious about yep. it. Yeah. So that, um, that pathway looks like it's, Almost on the lot lines. I'm sorry, Mrs. Gonzalez, you yeah. were asking a question. <laughs> I think we were in the same line of thought. Right. So, Mr. Hertz, well, that, yeah, what I saw in that picture was it looked like a little playground with a slide like, yeah. in somebody's yard. Um, mm -hmm. So, that's what caught my attention. The, the, so, I wondered if there was a house right there. The house is down, the house is, the house is to the south. The, the telephone pole with the with, is is sort of right there at the corner, okay. And the swing set, the swing set That's you saw would be sort of above where the cursor is right now. Okay. All right. So the all right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. 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 It, it went through a lot more private properties, and I was pretty adamantly opposed to any kind of eminent domain taking period. So we asked you to go back and regroup and replan, and it looks like you have done <coughs> kind of miles and miles of work here. But I still have questions on at least one of those parcels, actually a couple of those parcels. It's another reason we need an IT person because all you need to do <coughs> is run a drone right through this whole thing. We could have been watching a video of it. That would have cleared up a lot of these questions for us. We, it's really short money to hire someone that could go through with the drone and just, you know, show us what this looks like. Um, the second property that you showed, if you can go, can you shrink this up a little bit so we can go back to what you so, so which property Lambert so property so delisle is all one yeah right can you put it back to the whole show the whole map oh, oops. <coughs> so the in that in that property that has the three different private properties. And you said there's a sliver of that that's town-owned that you're running oh, okay, it through. Okay, okay, okay. That. Is, it, is there a way at least to avoid two out of those three by coming up over the side, or is that too close to the river? You said zero. Is it zero? Is our uh, town that we no? The the, town it's the, the, the the river. The piece that's that's sort of half in the river. That's owned by the town. The that sort of um, half a circle piece is owned by uh, the the Heim family. I mean that land is all marsh. That that land isn't like anybody's yard. It's 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 all swamp. So my my second question to you is, and I I'm. I'm, I'm 
You are applying for eight hundred and fifty thousand in grant funding. Grant funds, right? No, I'm applying eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars in town money. Three hundred thousand dollars in grant funding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is why it's, it's late, and this is why I tell you we're in my shaft at 10. So, the, 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 so let me just, okay. because I understand that there's, there's DOT, and, but we're the ones that have to talk to the residents. I, and I understand we don't need anything signed, a contract signed on the dotted line, we're going to buy your land. But we certainly have to have some, some assurances some type of assurances by the people, even if it's marshland, it's their land. So, I I don't I don't understand the we we got to do this in phases, and we'll do the money first, and then get the assurances. It's not a signed contract, so just help me understand that because I don't understand it. Um, if you if you can, I, I mean I I, I, I don't know. If, what point it's, I'd be cautioned by general by town council not to go. I mean, we we these people have all received letters. Um, the, these two properties have not responded to our letters. Um, uh, I mean, I'm happy to talk to them, um, and and um, you know the idea was to run it through land that was basically not used for anything. So. Um, I mean, if that's the, uh, I don't know how to answer it. I've been, I've been okay. cautioned not to not to have any in-depth discussions about easement acquisitions. Okay, because to me that would be a natural step before going on the eight fifty. But I'm not. I, 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 not, I agree. I don't I, mean I, to. You you've done an amazing job I, here, and you put a lot so of heart and soul into this. So um, let me just ask if before we before we move on. Any questions of the finance committee, Mr. Kelleher? The eight hundred and fifty thousand would be you, you're going to be looking for that in June, in hopes of getting three hundred of it back in grant. Yes, perhaps. exactly. When does the other eight hundred and fifty thousand come up? The other estimated to be eight hundred and some odd thousand um, would come when we um, finish finish the f initial design, which could take. A year could might even take two years. Um, we would um, have all of the easement discussions at that point, and then and then we would come, to, you know, the, the, then we would come back for um, the subsequent funding. Who, with the eight hundred, with the eight hundred and fifty thousand, with the initial eight hundred and fifty, cover any payments for easements or no? Is, no. Who would, who would pay for those easements? Is that going to be part of the DOT grant? No. The town is responsible for the for the easement. So if there are, if there are, if, 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 if we can come to, come to terms with, with, with uh, the landowners and acquire the easement, then we would go to town meeting for the money to acquire the easement. So that's why, if you look, at, I, you know, it's, it's I built in some money to acquire the easements. When I say $2 million, it's assuming that there's going to be some money involved to acquire the easements. So that would be on us, not on, on the state. Right. The state, North Reading would be responsible for something like $2 million. The state would be responsible for something like 10 for a project that costs 12 Mr. Keller, okay. you all set? Other questions in the finance committee? All set? Please, by a show of hands, how many people do want to speak in public comment? Okay. So, if it, there's quite a few of you, and some of you may want to, to speak more than that. We also received two letters that we'll talk about at the end. But, Mr. Hertz, can you, will you mind just grabbing that seat and using that microphone in front of your seat? Just in case, we don't usually have a dialogue back and forth. We're certainly not going to have argument. <coughs> I'm just going to say that right off the bat. You're here. We appreciate that you're here. We want to hear why you're here and what your concerns are, too. And while we have Mr. Hertz, if, if there's anything he can ask, and if there isn't, we're going to make a note, and we'll get your names and numbers and get back to you on it. 
So please, sir, if you could come to the podium, state your name and your address. <coughs> My name is Ralph Savard. I'm 90 Park Street, right next to the Ohio residence, where you folks clearly what saw that the trail goes okay. right next to my property. But one of the biggest issues with everybody here mm -hmm. is it it might be on town property, but it abuts people's lands two feet, five feet That's off of right. their yard. And nobody here, such as myself, and you, you clearly saw it because I think Mrs. Gonzalez brought it up that it looks like it's awful close to the neighbor <coughs> property. That's me. Mr. Hertz in his main presentation stated all the times that he's had meetings and, and he had a discussion with Mr. Delisle. About six months after that, he had a long discussion with Mr. Delisle and myself about absolutely positively not. But that didn't make, make, make this. In other words, you, you don't, you're opposed to the bike trail. 1,000%. When we have people, when, and the reason we had this discussion with him because he posted the picture of the way the rail trail is going, and we had people walking through my yard with my five-year-old daughter at her swing set. When my when my wife's out there, comes yelling, there's men walking through my backyard because he posted it. But I still don't get a, any type of letter regarding this whole issue. They also claim that it's Mr. Delisle, it's away from his house. It's not. If you look at any type of pictures, and he's been on the property because we caught him trespassing on the property. He, he neglects to put those pictures up here. Can we keep the dialogue just about the topic, not about a person, please? Well, your, your well point, I think your, what, what your message present? is important okay. to us. Okay. Don't lose it in the message, okay. please. Okay. Sir. The people that are all here that are impacted that have not been notified, that's where we really want the board here to see that the issue is. It might be town owned property, but it's two feet off of her backyard. It's going through this person's backyard. The other thing in the main presentation, but now all of a sudden tonight, it's been eliminated going towards 28. He's, this committee is asking for 850,000 up to 2 million, which we know is gonna turn into potentially additional monies here for this. Why would we stop there? If this is such an important project for the town, why would we stop the presentation there and not get to the end get goal here? that he claims that it is to get over 28 with the path time in Wilmington. I think it's unfair that the board only hears that aspect of this. It's either he's gonna get the whole thing, he's gonna push the way, the, this committee is gonna push its way through all these people's properties, and then we're gonna stop and we're gonna have this again. I think that the board needs to ask a little bit more about that also. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Steve Delisle. Uh, the property is 3 Mount Vernon Street. And Phil, can you put that picture back to my property? With the swing set? I don't think there's a swing set on there, but go ahead, yeah. No. Oh, that's the old swing set. Yeah, okay, yeah. That's, a, that's an old picture. Five, five years ago. No, the picture doesn't pay it justice. That is probably, that picture there to Ralph's property is probably. 30 feet away. Which one is it, sir? Oh, the middle one. one. Oh, oh, middle. Middle. Oh, if you oh. took a picture from the other side of that telephone pole, that is where he has it on the red line. That red line is going right through the middle of my yard. Right through the middle of the yard. And it's not going to happen. He showed me other options when he first came and we had the meeting with BSC group and all. There were options of going through the, I told him I'd work with him on the part of my property that's in the woods, the abandoned rail track. That's not abandoned. That's the property I use. I sit in the back up there. My picnic table is up there. I'm not gonna give it up. I told him I'd work with him. He had an option to go across my property and out the back. I'm sure it's more abundance he has to deal with. So that's why it's going this way. But it just, just the, the, this is, this isn't right. If I could say, sure. the, the one of the reasons why the state does not 
allow you to acquire land at this stage is because the, the route is never de is not definite until after the 25% design phase. So if, if there's an alternative that will work better, it's not cast in stone. No, I understand. I mean, it, it, we have to start somewhere. And I, 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 worked with, I worked with the property across the street, and there was a good suggestion, and we've modified it. So we can modify it. Um, this is the most direct route. If there's a, no harm, I mean, we can, and MassDOT feels the same way. There's no problem if we go along Mount Vernon and if we do something else. That's what I had asked you before when you said it would have cost too much money. Oh, no, money, money isn't. Uh, now it's not. <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> all right, folks, let's that's, I, that's, that's appreciate it. Yep. Appreciate Thank it. You. And we have your name and address. Yep. So it's important for us to, to get together for the dialogue. And I don't want people to bash Mr. Hurts. I'm, I'm trying to bash you my was, I, We had a discussion. But it is important to definitely have you be, a, be at the table talking about this if it goes to, through or besides your parcel. Just leave me a quick comment here. I'm at 170 Elm Street, North Reading. Um, first of all, I have please never, state your name. Deborah Pascal. I have never been on Facebook, so I am not prejudiced for having misinformation. The information I have received is from the feasibility study from this, from the maps that I've seen through the town. So not everybody is getting their information from Facebook. I understand that is valid points, but we're not all in that category. As a resident of North Reading and on the Ipswich River for 22 years, I'll tell you that the amount of water on that river and wetlands is extraordinary. It's been flood stage after flood stage and flooding more and more. There's very little solid land to put in pilings or anything else. And unless you're on that river and you see it time and time again, you're not going to really understand the dynamics of how that river changes. The 100-year flood that we had on Mother's Day, do you remember that? My house was flooded all the way up to the street on all sides of my house, up to in, four feet into my basement. That I don't think you're considering. The other thing of it is, and I just want to say briefly, um, as a representative of the, um, the Nicosia family on Railroad Ave, the railroad bed goes behind her Nicosia's garage and through the condos there. But you want it to go through the middle of her property, between her house and the garage. I don't think that is a reasonable thing. People Thank on you. Rail. <coughs> on the street itself. No, it's not. It's behind. It's behind that street. I've seen the maps. I'm done. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Steve O'Sullivan, Nine Apple Tree Line. Um, my property is the top right there. Um, so I'm probably one of the few nerds in this place that actually read the feasibility study. I've been following the whole rail trail thing. I use that railroad bed often. This is the first time I've been told. That that, product, that that easement is going to be used to access the uh, rail trail. I am shocked by the lack of transparency. No discussion, no conversation. So that's my daughter's car, that's my driveway, my house is right there. I called my neighbor next door today to tell him about this. When I heard about it, he had no idea. Either. So, like I said, I, I don't mind listening and hearing what's going on, but there's no transparency at all with this. Like I said, the first time hearing about it, you're going to access this thing through my property. It's wrong. So I'd love a phone call from somebody. If you want to come, stop, take a picture, knock on my door. I work at home every day now. I'm there. I can take you for a tour. Anybody wants to come back there and take a walk? Because I use it all the time with my dogs. It's a great little area. I can't say I'm opposed to the bike trail, but not through that because it doesn't make sense. You know? If, and then my thing is, what are you going to do about parking? I mean, instead of parking up on Elm Street, right on 62, people are going to park right there. Yep. And that Park Street area from Apple Tree up to Mount Vernon, it's about this narrow. So I have no idea where you're going to put sidewalks in there. So you're going to start taking other people's property to slide in when you're walking between Apple Tree and Mount Vernon. So there's a lot of 
questions here that gotta get answered, and probably a lot more money than it goes into that. So whatever your $2 million bill is, sidewalks, road improvements, so I'm telling you, it's not gonna be good. And I'll be fighting you, I'll be talking at least you guys got, at least you guys got notice. <laughs> all right, now, I'm gonna go. Because I need to see it then. So, all right. Thank you. Thank you. John Nowasaki from 10 Pleasant Street in North Reading. Um, my property is not directly affected by any of this. I, I have two quick questions and then a comment. If you could go back to that slide that showed um, the, the, high, the high school, the, the bridges, the two bridge bridges. Well, there were two bridges on Across the, the same slide. The one, the one, on El, the one by Elm Street. Yeah. 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 I, I might have just misunderstood. Uh, yep, that one. Yeah, that's it. You blew it up before, but that's good enough. I'm, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, but it seems like the bridges that you're talking about are bridges that go across the wetlands. Yeah, above the wetlands. Yeah, the supporters above the wetlands. Correct. Right. But the, are they also going over the top of Route 62 and going? No, no, no. They're, they're on the south so side. How are all the kids, children, users of these right. things, are you proposing people dash across a state highway with 62 and dash across Haverhill Street, which is another very busy right. street. So we're we talking about the bridge that's on 62 in the east by on Elm Street, or the bridge that's on Park Street by the high school? Oh, there's a bridge. Okay. There's a bridge that goes over the, from the high school, so the, and then there's a, you have to cross Haverhill Street. Okay, so let's talk about the bridge that's on Elm Street. That bridge will have parking for maybe 10 or 15 cars on the south side of Park Street. No, no, I'm not talking about that one. That's that's my comment section. But there's you're talking about there. The, the, and and going across Haverhill Street, where you don't have to have a bridge over over Muck, but you have to cross. Yeah, but there'll be a there'll, 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 there'll be a pedestrian crossing. Sorry. Sorry. Stop all the traffic on Haverhill Street every time somebody. Have you ever been to go? Have you ever been to Route One? I, I don't know what I'm the Topsfield Fairground. I've been in North Reading. Sir, Bill, sir, sir. <laughs> I've been in Reading. Please provide your comment. I'm sorry, but it isn't a conversation about okay. food. We I'm can't just, even hear you. All right. So I'm just, I'm please just, just give us your comment. Okay. The, the comment I have about the parking on across the street from Pleasant Street mm -hmm. is going to be bought by most of the people who live on Pleasant Street because right now we're dealing with those dirt bikes and those ATVs and pickup trucks and trailers that come and park at the end of Pleasant Street right now to gain access illegally to playing in these woods on the other side. Pleasant Street was built around 1952. I moved in in 1982 and I've seen all the increased traffic on 62 and we've now seen this encroachment of these people who want to take their dirt bikes and ATVs, they don't just clog up the end of Haverhill Street where we've had a great increase in the number of accidents. Telephone pole has been taken down on 62 by a car. Two cars have driven off the road into houses right on 62. That's a state road. The last thing we ever need on 62 is more cars getting onto and turning off of Route 62. <coughs> There's way too much traffic there as it is right now, so that's going to be a nightmare for a parking lot to be there, and it's going to be bought by everybody on the Pleasant <coughs> Street. And it's going to be absolutely dangerous. It's already dangerous for people on that side, the north side, to try to run across 62 to get to that parking lot, to that access. There's going to be carnage. It's going to be awful, just like it will be for people to try to cross Haverhill Street or cross 62 if there aren't elevated bridges across the top. Thank you, sir. Hey everyone. Yeah, uh, Matt Don, you 19 Woodland Drive. Um, I sent an email to the group yeah. a while back. You sure back. did. So, yeah. <laughs> I won't get into all that. I just had you know, a couple quick questions. So, you know, well, know. well written and we're going to put it into yeah. the record. No, so yeah. Yeah. I appreciate it. No, thank you, yes. Um, and thank you all for your hard work. I know this isn't easy, this is a tough job, and it's you know, not, a, not an easy thing to do, but I was just curious why on the map there, between the Delisle property and where it says wetlands and the red on the left, that yellow strip right there backs up to a number of my neighbor's houses and I, that's all protected wetlands, but it's not marked as wetlands on that map. So a lot of my questions go to 
wildlife support, stormwater management, how we're going to do that, what about trash and um, trespassing off of the path, how is that going to impact animals and nesting and all that as well. Um, something else that I don't think we've talked about is $850,000 for the first half, eight fifty for the second half, MassDoc pays for the construction. Who pays for the upkeep? So every couple of years with frosties yeah. and potholes, if we want kids riding rollerblades, bikes, skateboards, I would hope non-motorized vehicles, that's gotta be repaved. Miles of repavement, what's that cost to the town? What's that do to our taxes? How about vegetation management? So cutting the, you know, any vegetation overgrowing, has that been looked at? Lighting on the path, have we thought about lighting? So obviously that path in the back of my house is pitch black at night, um, very wooded, far away from everything. Do we have lighting? Do we have police presence? Are we gonna have a roving officer? Are we looking at another 100,000 plus to add a headcount to the town budget? Um, and did we say, was it illegal for members of the group to comment on Facebook about this? So can we explain why Rich was on there saying that many path options were considered, anyone who's been affected and is where, and many landowners have already agreed to support it? Wouldn't that kind of make people think that this has already been, people have already spoken to? Isn't that kind of a violation of what we're doing here? Nancy Neenhouse, and I live on 144 Elm Street. So the Pleasant Street piece would be right at the end of my property. Go. And I don't actually have any objection to that. I, th I understand what you're saying about Pleasant Street impact. Um, for myself personally, I would love a trail like this. The impossible task is to do it without harming my neighbors and friends. And I have questions too about upkeep and what that would cost to the town, because I know that for a lot of people, they're getting priced out of North Reading and can't afford the tax bills that we already have. So I am concerned about what happens after this beautiful thing is built, if we could satisfy the concerns that people have. Um, I've been on the Peabody uh, walkway and seen the wildlife come back, so I feel that we're gonna continue to see herons after something like this would be built, but I really share the concerns of my neighbors and worry about upkeep and impact my taxes. Thanks very much. Thank you. Can I speak, let me mention something about upkeep? Yes. So, so no, very early in the project, I, I attended an MAPC, Massachusetts Area Planning Council meeting where they brought by groups from different parts of the country in, and they were talking about upkeep. And the upkeep on a paved trail is, is minimal. Um, yes, there could be routes, but we're, since we're building it on an elevated uh, rail bed, I would expect that the, the, the rail path would stay stable for 20 years. When you look at the independent, if people walk the Independence Greenway in Peabody, they'll see that the trail is, is practically in perfect condition. It's been there for quite some time. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hertz. And, and I'm just, I don't, I, it probably goes without saying that, and I only have familiarity that, with the square for the, t the city that I work in that has a bike to the sea. The town, main, the, the city maintains that, but that's a little, totally different than this. It's through the MBTA, it was existing, and um, part of the arrangement and the lease between the city and the MBTA is, <coughs> is that the city would do the regular maintenance of it, routine maintenance. That's not a giant leap to expect that we'd be maintaining it if whatever needed to be done, however, you know, minimal or what have you. So, sir, please, yeah. your name mm -hmm. is Wayne your Smith, ass. one of the Smiths that own the property down there on Allen Street. And when you heard him open his meeting tonight, he said, What a beautiful piece of property it was down there on Allen Street. Well, let me tell you the truth so you'll know what the town is out of the town on our friend has treated us as a family. This is the fifth time that the property that we've had down here that they've come after something. They took a piece of property of 50 acres of land. You know what 50 acres of land is worth? 
in, back in 2002, they took the property. Steve O'Neill really knows this, and I, I would like to say to him, say, yes, it's true. But they took the property knowing full well he had no access to it because I owned all the property around me. They bought it anyway. They told the people that they, that they had access when they had no access at all. And it passed and they took the 50 acres. They paid 300, I mean, 3 million, 300,000 dollars for it to our family, which they thought was great. And I thought it was terrible. Took the, took the property, knowing full well they were never going to be able to use it. They lied to the town, telling them that it was going to be a school built there. And we're saying, how are you going to build a school here? It's all wet right here. The, that, that, that was one instance. That was, yeah, that was one instance. And then after they, they took the land, then they decided, well, we can't use it. We'll take easements from it. So they went to Superior Court with us. We beat him in Superior Court, and they didn't. And he says, "Oh, we gave it back." To, they didn't give it back. The courts gave it back. And then they said, "Well, we're going to put you out of business. We're going to throw you off the land." My grandparents had been there since 1898. I had to go back to all kinds of records for 12 years to prove that he was in there from 19 uh, from 1898, and then there was a business in there steadily ever since then. You know, they still thank God thank for the Superior Court. <laughs> but anyway, that was that was the fourth time. Now here they come again. They're going to take it. They want to take that line and go right down through the back property. Half the intent of going there is to go where they can get to that 50 acres of land. I mean, you're not calling me. But, you know, I'm talking about this. And this fellow, I tried to talk to him at the clerk's office because he wasn't even registered. He wasn't sworn in for the board. No, no, uh, uh, read it. Read is read not, she's on the LUC committee, but I don't know how they can vote when they're not, because they haven't been sworn in by the town, town clerk. All right, this, I don't know this, how they can vote. this is what I think they might be out. Exactly. If you don't, so you're opposed to the trail. You know I'm opposed. You <laughs> never get that. Really yeah, believe me when I tell you, yes. you'll never get that land again. You'll okay. never get any easy <laughs> Okay. Never. Ever. In the, the stupid parking lot that you're talking about. Mr. Smith, can you direct your comments, please, through uh, the wants, chair? If you want to put a parking lot up on 62 across from Pleasant Street, worst street in the world is 40, 40 mile an hour, 50 mile an hour, nothing. Mm -hmm. And if people are going to be pulling in and out of there going for a walk, you're going to get bumped off and everything else. It's a heck of a traffic pass. Why would you want to dump a walking trail out in the 62? It's crazy. It's the worst program. Still, I'm amazed at you. I called you four times. All right, Mr. Mr. Smith. Called him four times okay. about this to discuss it. Right. And he wouldn't answer my phone call. So I left him a message the last call. And I said, Steve, you represent all the people, not just some of the people when, when it's convenient. I could go on up here for another half two hours. <laughs> I'd always wanted to be able to tell somebody the truth. Well, we they took that land. We appreciate your comment. doesn't affect my property in phase one. So phase two, if you can flip that, uh, there's a nice big red line right through it. Um, so I just wanted to go on record and say, give the town right now notice that you will never get an easement for that property. So I'll save you some time and save you some time coming and talking to me. So you'll never get an easement from me. And um, I'm also very concerned about how that affects the wetlands behind the property as well. So I am no strongly plans. opposed. No plans to go forward. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. I'm a host, and you'll never get an easement through there. So thank you. Good luck. Let's keep the just through the chair, please, folks. Anybody else? Ms. Moan, Ms. Mo, we can we can come to you, but I want to make sure we have everybody have an opportunity, okay? 
Christelle Bergmeier, 83 Park Street. Um, I just want to say I have a, a statement that I had sent to you yes. guys. Um, Thank you. It was made up yesterday based on the feasibility study that we received from Mr. Hertz last week. So it has changed a little bit since then, tonight's presentation. Um, I am here as, speaking as a re representative uh, for the group of private property owners that this rail trail will be crossing through via proposed easements. We would like to acknowledge all the hard work that Mr. Hertz has done over the last three or so years or more. We can certainly see that this is a passion of his and that he has dedicated much time into it. That being said, we the private property owners are opposed to the plans as they were presented to us in the feasibility study of January 2022. Our collective concerns are a lack of transparency and communication on this project, the infringement of our privacy and our ownerships of our private property via easements, the conservation of wetlands and the environmental impact of vegetation, vernal pools, wildlife, and other sensitive species, <coughs> and the general safety of our young children playing in our properties while the, trial, tr while the trail cuts right through along with questions of trail safety as a whole as well. Thank you, and this is from all the easement um, impact. <laughs> Our letter <coughs> as well as Matthew's letter. Matthew. So we're going to put that as part of our record Thank you. as well. Thank so you. As part of our, our record of our minutes. Does anyone else? My name is Kirsten Mead. I live at 21 Woodland Drive. I actually live right next to Matt. I guess my question is, would it help you? Because our neighborhood has all gotten together and we have also written letters. We have not sent them because we wanted to come tonight. We are opposed to this, even though it is not our land. Our children do run back there. They are safe back there. They are allowed to play back there. And if you now have all these people coming through our land, even though we don't own it, changes the dynamic of our neighborhood significantly. So we would like to know if you would like to have all of our letters as well for public record. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Is there anyone else that wants to speak? Is everybody that wants to speak had an opportunity? Ms. Mom, Mom. Do you want to? Did you want to make any comments? <coughs> as a member of L, as a member of LUC, absolutely. Um, I want to make a comment. If it seems like we haven't been transparent, then that's obviously a belief. LUC will definitely schedule one or two meetings. So that he, they don't have to be a hearing, so be meetings, go through it so that everybody will have a chance to talk as much as you want and get this, this you know, through that you're looking at the right property. LUC is the one sponsoring. <coughs> we only have eight votes, uh, nine votes in the committee. And We'll definitely go over this, take all the information. LUC will uh, also be able to vote on what we said originally. The plan is going to be to try to go around anybody that had no intention of taking it. LUC has been around for 26 years, and Mr. Smith and I can talk later, but there definitely are some, some facts that weren't correct, but we'll talk about that at another time. So it's not, uh, because you said it doesn't mean it's true, because I say it doesn't mean it's true. But I can tell you, if you ever tell you see for 26 years, um, and sometimes I sign in late for uh, our appointments, but I'm still a member. And like I said, we have built the Twitch River Park where we didn't take anybody's property, and we decided uh, there are sometimes for the people that say, I don't want it in my backyard. It's, it's okay to say that. You absolutely have that right, you have the right to vote that way. But if we did that way, if we voted that way on everything in town, you wouldn't have most of our parks because every park is beside somebody's home. You wouldn't have a school because every school is beside somebody's home. So everybody has to take this decision, make the decision at the end, how you're going to vote. We cannot help it. If you purchase the property next to town owned land, the things can go on town owned land. If you choose not to have it, you can vote against it at town meeting. But I will promise you, we will be very transparent. We have one to two meetings before the next uh, town meeting to go over this. Obviously, there's a lot of questions. It's uh, a shame that we had to put it on at the last minute. But like they said, they wanted to answer a lot of questions that had been on Facebook. I don't go on Facebook a lot and see it. I don't answer the, the, the problems. We want to answer it. We'll be transparent. 
and I will call the chairman tomorrow and make sure we make at least one more meeting, if not two, so that anybody wants to come, Phil will have to bring you out another night. But I will tell you that Phil is one that came to three meetings. I'm on LUC and I'm on recreation, it's legal. Um, to be on two meetings. <coughs> but when Phil came to us about uh, the trails, and for 26 years we've been talking about trails, because I've been on recreation for 48 years, and I've participated in at least seven open space plans where we've talked about trails in town. So it's good that we've got all this, the people interested and I'm glad. We'll make sure we have some um, meetings, there'll be transparency, and then everybody can vote based on what the facts are. LUC can, they've got to make the presentation at town meeting, and I don't want Phil being thrown under the bus because of the rest of the LUC members are here. So I'm telling you, I invited him to be a member because you don't get a lot of people that are as conscientious and excellent at what he does. We don't have to all agree with it or not, but it was excellent. I asked him to join the committee because just like Mike O'Neill, who was in town, volunteered 12 years of his life to build a picture for the park. You need professional people to go through and do this. Phil has done an excellent job, and I'm sorry that he's the one that's getting, uh, you know, the, the, the blame for a lot of things tonight. I'll put the blame on LUC. Should have been more meetings. We've had a lot of meetings and come here, but we can say you come to a selectman's meeting, 99% of us in town do not watch selectman's meeting and you don't see it. Doesn't mean it's right, but I give Phil the, uh, you know, his, when we first started this, he met with as many neighbors as he could. So you're right to feel like something shouldn't happen in your backyard. You can vote it up at the last minute if you don't want it in your backyard. But there are a lot of things that have been voted on. Uh, and you know, as long as you're not walking through your property, that's all we have to make sure that doesn't happen. So we will have another meeting and thank you for the time and invite you all on the meeting. Can I make a comment on that? Just two words. Absolutely. Jeff and Pascal, 170 Elm Street. Two things we didn't speak about. How do the police feel about this? How are they going to be assisting on these trails? How much is it going to cost us for them to increase their force? Is that a consideration? And then what about liability? I spoke to my insurance agent about it today. Unless it's eminent domain, is the town going to be liable for accidents on these trails, on people's houses, on the land? Who is responsible there? Thank you. Very good. Is that a set schedule we have? Or it is, is, but is there a way that you guys can, like, just look at I'm sorry. Excuse me. They do post, but I don't, we can ask if they have a next scheduled meeting. They re meet regularly. So is there <coughs> another meeting schedule? Is there a scheduled meeting April 4th or 5th? Uh, right now it's a certainly full agenda, but uh, I think we need to do like a, a scheduled one. Right after the book, we can start to discuss this from more time. So, you so can go, go online to the town website. This is one of the good things about it with the calendar, and all the agendas are posted there, and you should be able to check the calendar. But if there, we have your contact information, if there's a way, read it, you can just email, maybe exchange your email. That's so what I was you gonna know. ask, like you guys have your agenda. Now, no. let me just explain to the people that, because what, the, our next item is a review of the warrant articles, and most of you are, have been here for years and years and years, longer than I have, and you know that the boards and commissions can put a warrant article on the town warrant. And the LUC has put this on the town warrant for discussion at the next town meeting. Our board looks at all these and reviews these, and we take a vote whether or not as a select board we recommend it, just like the Finance Committee, whether or not they recommend it. And we talk, tell the public, we vote in our meetings, and then we tell the public that during the town meeting. So the town rules. Whatever the town Welcome wants, to Zoom. Transpires the Enter town your meeting, meeting ID. You have followed to by town town. vote on it. So it's a warrant article. What Mr. <coughs> Walner is saying is it's a warrant article, and it is true that it's a warrant article sponsored by the LUC, but it's also true what Mr. Studo said. We haven't taken a vote yet on whether or not as a board we recommend or don't recommend it, and neither has a finance. I think you're participant. I do. So just for, for you to be aware of that. You You'll see it in your packet on the warrant article because LUC is sponsoring this to move forward. And so hopefully between now and then, 
maybe there's some things that can be done or discussions that can be had that will be beneficial to resolving some of these issues. Anything else you want to add, Mr. Hertz? <laughs> I think it's pretty much been said. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks for thank you for uh, the presentation. Madam Chair, just Madam Chair, if I might, just to address uh, uh, Billy. Yeah. Billy Smith is a good friend. Billy Smith has been a good friend of mine my entire life, and also a former colleague on the board. You know, he served in this board for many years. He served in volunteer positions. He served in the CPC. He served in the Finance Committee. He served in the Board of Selectmen. Served in the Police Department. He's lived here his entire life, and I have the utmost respect for him. And I tried returning a call twice. I actually answered the phone twice when you called. And no response from you. But anyway, and I have no problems speaking to Billy at any time during the conversation. But in relation to the Smith property, which is now called River something else, Riverwoods. the town had the first opportunity, right of refusal, because it was farmland. So the same situation that we had before, all right? And the proposal was, he was going to build homes there. He was going to build maybe 40 be there. And the town made a clear decision that it was, they didn't believe it was in the town's best interest to have that happen and exercise their right to do so. There was questions in relation to the access and the accessibility of the property, and town meeting was well aware of it. And yes, there was some pr protracted litigation which finally resolved it. But, you know, we weren't in eyes wide open. We went in knowing that there were proposed housing developments to be proposed there. It wasn't to save the pristine property along the river. There was a proposal to build housing projects in there. So the town made a conscious, town meeting made a conscious decision to purchase that land in order to preserve it and maintain it for open space or future town use. So it's important to understand that town meeting made a conscious decision to utilize this space for future purposes, whatever they deemed appropriate. In relation to the proposal here, again, this is the first time I've seen this entire proposal, along with the rest of the board, except for maybe uh, Rich because he's been intimately involved as a liaison. And, and again, Phil has done a fantastic job, and we should all be grateful for getting it to the stage that we're at, to even be able to go to the state and say, what do you think? And they're saying, here, we have $10 million for you if you're willing to put up two. You know, is that something you want to do? Do we like to do things in relation to eminent domain takings and all this? No, we like friendly easements or we like other ways around it. Unfortunately, which again, we can't dictate what the state rules are. If we're not allowed to engage in negotiations prior to, and unless we spend $800,000, $850,000, does that make a lot of sense? No. Are those the rules of the game? Yes. So again, we have to make a conscious decision. This input is extremely important for us to make those decisions as to whether or not we're going to move forward or how can, how can we move forward? Is there a way? Would you let, you know, would you talk about an easement by your barn as opposed to coming off of, uh, from Alberta yeah, Street or uh, the back of your garage as opposed to, you know, maybe, you know. So those types of things are important for us to have. You know, can that happen? I heard that there's a, there's an opportunity here. Should that be pursued? Yes. So that we can have all the necessary information to make an informed decision to risk the $850,000 to get through the 25% so that we can finalize it. Again, where are the rest of the problem areas? I say problem areas in relation to getting access from property owners. You know, uh, we've got a couple other spots that you need to talk to. There were three other people. And if we can do that, I mean, you know, um, we should do that. But, all right, anyway, but thank you. But anyway, Billy, I love you. Linda, I love you. It's terrific. I got one more bottle that I'd like to be announced to you. I never filed for 40B in my life. It's another lie. There's one right there. Sir, please. 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 S
Michael, is there anybody? Mr. Gilberto, I'm sorry. Is there anybody? There's no hand raised. I'm sorry. I'm about to check. Is it I am not seeing anyone. Yes, please. I live at 230M. Would you say your name? Oh, Linda Smith, 230M. I live 1,200 feet back. All the brush has really grown up. I used to clip it every year. But my main concern is people come from all over. They let all the dirt bikes go out at the end of our private drive and they go through our property. And the kids walk through there for their running and I'm all by myself. One time a whole kindergarten came over there and were playing on my property. And I, I went out and asked, may I help you? Oh, we're just playing here. I said, well, this is all private property. And some people go behind my barns where my kids run the business. And I'm all by myself. I don't know who these people are. That is my concern with, with um, people dropping all their dirt bikes and they're running right through my yard. Thank you. If I could add, the dirt pipes have been a real problem, not, not, not only in North Reading, but in, in Linfield. And one of the advantages of having this trail is it'll all but eliminate the dirt bikes. Uh, and it will, it'll, it will help Linda, because the people right now, the only way they can get in there is through Wright Street and through her property. If we build this bridge, people won't go through Wright Street. They won't go by her property. They'll come across the bridge. Thank you. Oh, Thank you. Okay. Should we get to the next next order of business? We still have an honor. Yeah, he's waiting. I can't. I can't. No, I'm just here to listen. Other people waiting. Not my club. I'm listening. <laughs> public comment is next. <laughs> I'm happy to go through the articles. <laughs> Yeah, so they were resolved at the beginning of the meeting. They were tied to the audio not working. <coughs> Can you stop the share? Let me just press the red button. Thank you. Order of business, which is a review of the list of articles for the June 6th town meeting. Sorry, are you trying to pull it up for the screen? I am, yes, Madam Chair. Are there 10, 20, 30? There are 28 that are proposed for discussion. And I will share my screen. I'm sorry. This is great for me. Yes, he's on the way. <laughs> on Zoom. No. Um, is the board? Is the board? Is it the board's um, pleasure to go to the auditor and then we can finish the rest of the business? Is that the town administrator and finance director's recommendation? May, may, we, no. may, may we switch to that? Is that what the finance committee is still waiting for? That's a question. Too tired to drive. Okay. Is that what the finance committee is still waiting for? Is that what the finance committee is still waiting for? Is that what the finance committee is still waiting for? Is that what the finance committee is still waiting for? Is that what the finance committee is still waiting for? Is that what the finance committee is still waiting for? Is that what the finance committee is still waiting for? Is that what the finance committee is still waiting for? Is that what the finance committee is still
Okay, there you go. <coughs> forward, forward agreement. Yes, sure. to that. Yep. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Through you, um, as everybody knows, our longtime uh, auditor, Dick Hingston, retired at, at the conclusion of the last audit. The finance director, at my request, uh, sent out a request for quotes to multiple entities. Um, after reviewing the responses with the finance director and then with the chair and the vice chair, uh, we conducted a final uh, interview with a representative of uh, what used to be Melanson and Heath, but what now goes by the name uh, Melanson, I believe, formally. And they are represented by Andrew Gordon, who is on Zoom here late into the evening. I, uh, <laughs> I told you, colleague, it would be late. I did not expect it to be this late. <laughs> and, not the end of the world. Uh, very nice to meet you uh, via Zoom here. Um, it is um, it is uh, my recommendation that the board uh, vote to appoint Melanson uh, as the auditor uh, in accordance with the motion that's written, been presented. Um, I believe, I won't speak for the chair and the vice chair, but they, uh, there's also been conversations with them as well. Um, to make it clear for the board members who don't know and for the rest of the community, the auditor is the uh, independent outside oversight of the financial operations of the town. So it is an appointment of the select board and we felt it was important to involve uh, the chair and the vice chair in identifying the candidate and bringing them forward. Uh, they are the check and balance, if you will, uh, for the operations of the financial departments, including not just accounting, but the treasury and collections as well. Um, Madam Chair, if it's okay, I just would ask Mr. Gordon for just a brief introduction about uh, his firm. Um, you know, we'll ask him to keep it brief. Uh, I've given them all the information from your website, uh, Mr. Gordon, so they do have that. Okay. Can everyone hear me clearly? Yes. yes. Yep. Okay. Uh, so my name is Andrew Gordon, and I've been with Melanson CPA for approximately nine years now. I'm currently working in a supervisor capacity under Scott McIntyre. My expertise has primarily been in municipal, town, and city audits, as well as doing single audits of federal programs. And I look forward to the possibility of working with the town on their fiscal 21 audits. If anyone has any questions, I'll leave it open to you guys. Questions? Go ahead, kid. Because how many cities and towns uh, have you been involved with, or the firm been involved with over the last five years, let's say? Oh, what was that? How many cities and towns do you uh, do audits of, and how many have you done in the last five years? How many communities? I would say, on average, we do anywhere from at least over, as a firm as a whole, we've probably done well over 75 to 100. We do on, the, I'd say, on a yearly basis. And then me personally, with my staff and my team, we do approximately anywhere from, I'd say, 15 to 20 audits on a yearly basis. Okay. Right. And that, that's a municipalities. That is municipalities, correct. Okay. Yep. Right. Thank you. And any other questions? Just, just, a, just a general question. When we were going through the due diligence, um, so Melanson obviously provided all their materials. Did the other people you had suggested just not supply materials? Is that what happened? Or? Um, I'm going to ask the uh, finance director just to summarize that process for folks just because you, you just probably have the names more accurate than I do. Sure. So the process, um, some of you may not know, but to select a um, outside independent auditor, we do not need to go through the RFP process. You can do an RFQ process or you can just um, request quotes from uh, various CPA firms that deal with municipal audits. There's, you know, um, a handful that um, do them within Massachusetts. <coughs> we solicited quotes um, from <coughs> three other firms than Melanson, and we, um, myself, the town administrator, the chair and vice chair, met with one other firm. Um, one firm did not um, have any space to fit us uh, in 
their uh, client's base and <coughs> the other firm um, declined to close. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No questions. No further. All set. Any other questions? Okay. All right. It's a motion. That was a good fine. <laughs> I am familiar with Melanson when it was Reliance and he um, through their services that they provided to Malden, which is the town that I work on. And they were positive. I would only have positive things to reflect. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry. Do we have a motion? Madam Chair, I move to appoint Melanson as town auditor to audit fiscal year 2021. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Mr. Gordon, Mr. Gordon, thank you for staying on um, you, this you. evening. Um, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Thank you all very much for the invitation tonight. <laughs> and uh, the finance director will be in touch. Thank you, Andrew. Okay. We'll be we'll, thank we'll you. be on the Oscars next year. <laughs> oh, and you we'll saw it first. Room. I know. Really. <laughs> Keep it under control. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. Great introduction to our town. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> okay. Madam Chair, and he to still us. stayed. It's like Dan. He's still with us to the end of the day. Dan's leaving early. Oh, I know, really. Please, Mr. Strudo. Madam Chair, I move to appoint Susan Duplin as records access officer for an indefinite term. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Uh, me? It's a roll call name. Oh. Mr. O'Leary. Yes. I don't, yes, Mr. O'Leary. Uh, Susan Duplin. 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 How do you say? Duplin. The town clerk. Duplin. 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 I'm sorry. Yeah. I know. Duplin. Susan Duplin. Susan Duplin. Mr. Wong. Getting that name down. Susan Duplin. Mr. Studo. Susan Duplin. Mrs. Gonzalez, Susan Duplin, and Manny Kelly, and Susan Duplin. Madam Chair, I move to appoint Susan Duplin, not Suplin, as State Ethics Commission liaison for a term to expire on December 31st, 2022. Second. Motion by Mr. Strudo, second by Mrs. Gonzalez. Yep. <laughs> Name, call, roll, roll call vote. Mr. O'Leary. Susan Duplin. Mr. Walmer. Susan Duplin. Mr. Studo. Susan Duplin. Mrs. Gonzalez. Susan Duplin. May I tell you, Ms. Du Susan Duplin. Madam Chair, I move to appoint Susan Duplin as to a local <coughs> census liaison to the U.S. Department of Commerce for an indefinite term. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Mr. O'Leary. Susan Duplin. Mr. Walmer. Susan Duplin. Mr. Studo. Susan Duplin. Mrs. Gonzalez. Susan Duplin. May you tell you, Susan Duplin. Madam Chair, I move to appoint Susan Duplin as member of the board registers for an indefinite term. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. O'Leary. Susan Duplin. Mr. Walner. Susan Duplin. Mr. Studo. Susan Duplin. Mrs. Gonzalez. Susan Duplin. Manny Kelly is Susan Duplin. Like many town employees, she needs a big hat rack. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> and uh, then we have Madam Chair, I move to reappoint Kylie Gainwin is a member to the Board of Registers for a term to expire April 1st, 2025. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Just Mr. Uh, O'Leary. Just that, uh, well, first of all, she's, uh, oh, I'm she's sorry. been recommended, you know, by the uh, Democratic sorry. Town Committee to be the Democratic representative on the Board of Registrars. Uh, so it's recommending to the board that uh, she be reappointed. So fortunately, she's willing to uh, continue to serve. So we're grateful for her service. Okay, this is a motion by Mr. Strudo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Mr. O'Leary. Kylie Gamlin. Mr. Walner. Heidi Gamlin. Kylie. Kylie. Hi. Kylie. 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 Kylie Gamlin. Sorry. Mr. Studo. Kylie Gamlin. Mrs. Gonzalez. Kylie Gamlin. And Manny Kelly's Kylie Gamlin. That's it for appointments. That's it. Let's go back to the review of the uh, town meeting warrant articles. <laughs> Mr. Gilberto. Thank you, Madam Chair. <coughs> Up on the screen is the listing of articles for the Monday, June 6, 2022 Spring Annual Town Meeting. I will just note that Articles 1 through 22 are at this point routine articles, so I'm not going to go over them in depth. 
other than to say that we do have some remaining business involving the transfer of free cash that we normally do at October town meeting, we will now need to do um, within some of these articles, including the transfer to the other post employment benefits liability. No, I got that wrong, including to the participating funding arrangement fund number eight, which we normally pass over at June town meeting, as well as a transfer to the solid waste stabilization fund, which we uh, normally would have done in the June town meeting last year, deferred until October. Uh, but now we'll need to do this June as well. So those are just two that I would call out that are otherwise routine. And yes, I am considering articles 21 and 22 relative to pending litigation to be routine at this point because they show up on every single <laughs> warrant. <coughs> Article 23 and 24 at the request of the board during the tax, tax classification hearing are uh, property tax uh, exemption related. Article 23 would allow for the increase in an exemption for disabled veterans from $400 to the statutory maximum of $800, and that is our recommendation. Article 24 would increase the income limit for eligibility in uh, for property tax deferral for the elderly um, from the current limits to the limits established by uh, statute under the circuit uh, senior circuit breaker program at the state level. Um, so the assessor did do her homework on that and has reported back and has submitted these articles. So, so they are both on there for consideration. Article 25 submitted um, by the fire chief for the board's consideration would update our general bylaws to uh, allow for uh, the proper, um, to apply the current bylaw for wired alarm notification systems to include wireless systems, which we are beginning a transition towards as a result of a capital project last year and state grant funding that will allow us to install wireless devices in, um, in municipal and school buildings. Articles 26 and 27 were submitted by committees. Article 26 by the forestry committee for a forestry consultant. I believe that is estimated to be $50,000, Mr. Walner, if I have to get the liaison. Article 27, rail trail, rail trail design and plan submitted by land utilization, um, projected at $850,000. And uh, a final item that I just noted for discussion is that we have had ongoing conversations amongst the wastewater planning group for potential um, submission of an article for a general bylaw amendments no, related no. to. Okay. Do you do that on purpose? Well. If that's it wasn't intentional because really she still has her coat. If that's locked, hang on the back of the chip. <laughs> she's like that's right. Or unlock it. <laughs> so the general bylaw. Um, this would amend the general bylaws to um, put within the code the uh, sewer, uh, a, an updated sewer betterment program, and um, it's on the listing as something for consideration as we move towards closer towards the wastewater project. Um, we can make a determination whether we want to actually have the bylaw considered in June, at October, or at the special town meeting uh, in conjunction with the appropriation of fundings, funding for the wastewater project. So overall, a pretty, I think, reasonable listing at this point in terms of what's been su submitted. Uh, the number of articles, that is, not necessarily the total cost. Um, we normally have a lot of um, you know, zoning bylaw related articles that have come in in June. Um, the Planning Commission has opted to sort of defer those until October uh, at this point. Um, so that's why you're not seeing them on this listing. <clears throat> I was wondering why there wasn't one on the sewer, but then I realized we're doing a special, a special, we're going to schedule a special meeting as that comes to fruition. Correct. Super special. It's also not ready. Huh? Yeah, also not ready. So are there any, yeah. right now, just, I know it's just a review, but are there any questions with regard to the, so far, what's posted? No. Um, I think we should do the 28 with the special meeting. It doesn't make sense to have it as a standalone meeting. <clears throat> Not necessarily. It, it, it would be, give me a little bit of the thought process behind it. This would be uh, an opportunity to present a discussion in relation to the betterments, how they would be assessed, okay. how future expansion of the system play into the assessments okay. and the betterments. And I think we were thinking that maybe it would be a good opportunity to, again, get the uh, general public better engaged mm -hmm. in relation to the issue itself, uh, the whole issue, uh, by tackling this earlier, again, if we're ready, mm -hmm. uh, tackling it earlier, have the discussion, get the bylaw in place, and then 
that can always be rescinded uh, because it wouldn't be affecting anybody if, it, if the project doesn't pass. But at least it would help from a transparency standpoint inform the public as to exactly how things are going to start working, what the machinations of the system is going to be. So that was the thought process. And again, keeping it in the forefront for the public to uh, be more engaged in finding out all the information necessary to make an informed decision come the fall. Okay. Any other comment? Questions? No? The next time you see the listing, it'll be in the form of um, drafted warrant articles you know, with a little more detail, but I think for the most part, you have, you have a, from this summary, you know what they each entail. I think <clears throat> that should go as number 26. <laughs> and then 20. Seven and twenty-eight, because then if we're sponsoring it, exactly, and also because we are evidently know that this this meeting may actually generate more attendance because of the real recreational trail. So that would be some good opportunity for just kind of some public in you know public information to to get out there. Yep, I'll make that change. It, it's only. They're not, they're not beholden to any particular order here. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions, comments? All set with this? You right. want the rail trail up front, huh? <laughs> no, I mean, it, it's. Um, You'd have a mass exodus. I yeah. right. Hold it to the end. <laughs> well, I think, you, I think we can, we should be able to get through many oh, yeah, of no, these. Oh, yeah, this is not, that's not. Yeah. Most of it's just stuff. It's, 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 it is truly a pretty routine. Yes, yeah. Warm. Is the format going to be back to the, in, inside. the auditorium versus gym? The Whatever intention that. is to, to pursue having it in the gym again, okay. facing Main Street where there is a large screen. If we can set that up, it should be better for audio visual. Is that, yeah, that's why I mentioned that because last time it was kind of, you know, mm -hmm. it wasn't really clear. Like half of the room couldn't, like, you know yeah. what I mean? You couldn't really follow along, so. Sure. All right, are we all set? Okay. So the next order of business is the memorandum of agreement with the North Reading Firefighters Local <coughs> number 1857, vote to ratify and sign. Madam Chair, I move to ratify and sign the memorandum of agreement between the Town of North Reading and North Reading Firefighters, IEFF Local 1857, from July 1st, 2020 through June 30th, 2021, and from July 1st, 2021 through June 30th, 2024. Second. With the change in, with with the the change in section six. Yeah. Right. Does he have to put something in about section six? Yeah, he, I think he just stepped there. With the change in section, you know, voting to ratify as, as amended in section six. Yes. Oh, correction. As as Scrivener's error. I'll okay, that. motion. Motion. Uh, Motion by Mr. Studio, second by Mr. O'Leary. In further discussion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Bye. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thanks for the great party, guys. Yeah. <laughs> Is that what that was? All right. Let's do let's do both board member reports and all the new business together. Oh. Well, if we had signed this 20 minutes later, we'd be signing on the 29th of the 28th. Oh. Yeah. Just got to oh, wait a minute. Did so we skip the town? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <Nate. laughs> Mr. Gil. I only have two matters. The first is. <laughs> Everything that, that needed to be said has been said. What's your point? <laughs> what's your say? Mr. Where my Mr. Gilbert, I apologize. Thank you. I just would wish to let the board know that today I participated in the two steps forward against anti-Semitism virtual summit for Massachusetts mayors and town officials, which was hosted by the Lappin Foundation. Um, there were over 150 municipal officials uh, and other um, officials who attended. A presentation included data showing an increase in anti-Semitism related crime, review of tools to identify anti-Semitism and strategies that have been employed in, in some communities. Um, secondly, I had provided a copy of an opinion from town council to the board with regard to the uh, drink water and wheeler properties at, at and near Ipswich River Park. 
Um, I have forwarded that to the interested stakeholders, namely um, those uh, on the Land Utilization Committee and the Facilities Master Plan Committee as well. So I'm sure there will be some discussion in the coming weeks, as well as the Hope Your Commission. Um, so I'm sure there'll be some discussion in the coming weeks on that matter as the Facility Master Plan continues its work. And that's all. That concludes my Great comments. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. So, nothing to report? Nice. Any new or old business? Dot. Thank goodness. Mr. Walker. Yes. Um, just uh, on the uh, uh, it's the Martin Pond Group, they're meeting actually tomorrow. I brought forward our thing about uh, potential dredging, and they're going to start checking that out right away. So they're going after that. They say they may need some extra weed control. It's not related to the things we killed before. It's water chestnuts or something like that. Anyways, they're working on that. But the big thing is they're going to start exploring the dredging because more than likely it's going to involve a consultant. To, you know, there's going to be expertise required here. There's a lot of issues to be considered. Um, and so they're going to start pursuing that right away as we've asked them to. Uh, the Forest Committee, you know, it's pending. We, we don't have anything resolved with the consultant, so it might very well fall away by the time the town meeting comes. But that is an attempt, again, to meet recreational plans and to open up Swan Pond to have better signage, more accessibility, some ADA compliance in that area, and make it a more available to the town than we've had before. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Sudo, I'll set Mrs. Gonzalez. Yes. Um, I just want to talk about the community impact team. They have actually a lot going on. They have a, a guiding good choices, skill building for parents. It's free. They have um, four meetings on March 30th, April 6th, April 13th, and April 27th. Um, strengthening bonds with children, increasing protective factors, and increased risk factors, prevent deep substance. Um, a great program. If you go on to there, the CIT's website, um, you can get more information and sign up for that. They're also doing the hidden in plain sight, which if anybody's ever done that, it's it's phenomenal. That's a great um, program. Showing you, you know, how things can be hidden and things that you would never think about. Also on their website, um, there's two dates for that. Um, and they're also doing um, Narcan training. They call it naloxone now, um, but it's Narcan. Um, and they're doing three trainings for that um, also on their website. You can sign up for that. That's great. Thank you. Oh, uh, and I believe we're both speaking at the Democratic uh, thing on Monday night. Are you going? So that is April 4th, right? It's April 4th. The, April 4th at the Hapothecary. It's, it's a candidate's night. So I think the Democratic Committee is sponsoring that. Yes. And all candidates all are invited. All candidates are invited. And, and hopefully it, they'll all go yeah, so we all can. All candidates locally and also there'll be some uh, statewide candidates uh, that have been invited to speak after the local Great. candidate. Great. What's the date? Fourth. Monday. 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 Seven. Man and I will be brief. <laughs> yeah, we're, <laughs> we're not the stars. We're not the controversy. <laughs> Seven o'clock. Seven o'clock. One dollar. Okay. Um, and what other thing I want? I was going to mention that, but I also wanted, and hopefully, members of the public will attend, and all the candidates that are running, at least for local offices here, will attend. You two are running, so that's yeah, why we're running. And there could be write ins at the last minute. Right. Else, you know? And hopefully, you know, the school committee. School committee, all five. <laughs> all, hopefully, all five of the school committee candidates are going to be there. Did I read something or someone told me that the uh, combined um, North Reading and Stone hockey mites won? Yes. The mite two team, uh, which is uh, second and in some cases third year mite skaters. Uh, they won the Valley um, playoffs for their section yesterday. It's great. Um, in April. Yeah. That's cool. Which is great. That's um, fantastic. So it's a, it was a great victory for them. The Mike Four team, the coach of whom, assistant coach of whom is in the room here, had a great season but did not prevail in the championship game. So. That's okay. There's Good always season next year. So they have to just keep working at it. Yeah. I like, had nothing from, to do with the coaching. From what I understand, <laughs> hockey, North Reading is known for hockey, hockey players, right? All so year now, round. Yes. All, All year, year round. round yeah. 
All right, that's, that I'm was it. I, I just wanted to make sure that, that you reported that candidates night, because I think it's important for people to show up and hear and understand whose platform <clears throat> is espoused by, by whom of the candidates that are running. So, yep. okay, uh, do we have a motion to adjourn? I'm adjourn. I move to adjourn. Okay. Motion by Mrs. Duda, second by Mr. O'Leary. All those in favor? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. Aye.